Warte da. Two Greetings bis. and salutations. Two bear. What's going on? They ain't even trying to play us no more. They don't give us no ads or nothing. I appreciate that. Yes. This is going to be glorious, as always. Anytime we get to come on YouTube, it's always a special situation. You don't let the fan man. Shout out to EYL University. Ernest, what's up? What's up? What's Shout up? What's going on? Man. We're about to get it going. I've unmuted myself. <laughs> yeah, let's get the, the young legend, Chris Senegal in the building. Let's get him up and running. Peace, peace, peace. There you go. Peace. Hope everybody got a chance to check out the Killer Mike episode. That's out right now on all platforms. The young legend himself. Chris, what's going on, brother? What's going on, family? How are y'all? Oh, we great, bro. Good, man. How are you? I'm great, man. I'm great. I'm blessed, man. Can't complain. Hey, yeah. yo, man. We got to make it back to H-Town. That's a fact. Yeah, we can't yeah, wait. Do, man. It, was, it was epic. It was too short. <laughs> <laughs> that was our first time. It was definitely a memorable one, man. For, for real. Right. And then COVID hit right before y'all were coming back, right? Yeah, we was we, we was talking to you. Remember, I was talking to you trying to work out like venues yeah. and dates and all that. Then they used to use like they had the rodeo going on and there was a bunch of stuff. We had to push it back because we had Philly and we uh -huh. actually could we couldn't get either one off. We had to cancel yeah, yeah. Philly like two days before, and Houston was supposed to be after Philly. So yeah. God willing, whenever this thing clears up, finally, man, we're coming back. We're coming back to Houston, full, yes, full, sir. full steam ahead. Got to make it happen, man. Got to make it happen. We had a good time out there, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shout out to H Town, man. Shout out to H Town for sure, man. So, yeah, man, we're gonna just you know let people um settle in here. But once again, thank you for for joining us. I feel like you know um we just shot your episode. It's crazy how time flies. That was man, yeah, really. But man, just watching the trajectory of EYL, man, it's been it's been phenomenal to watch, man. I'm like the biggest fan. Yeah, man. We shot that we shot yeah. your episode. We went to we did our uh our Houston uh open house in a sense, really our meet and greet. Uh -huh. it up. I was like, yo, man, we got a special one with you. <laughs> yeah, love that. I love that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was dope, man. That was dope. So, yeah, if anybody's not familiar, Chris Senegal, a legend in his own right. Um, episode 36 of Earn Your Leisure. You should definitely check that out if you get a chance. Mm -hmm. um, so at the time, this is actually dope because at the time he was like in the process of um, like he brought a whole block in Houston. So I won't go over the whole story because it's in the episode. So what happened is that, you know, he was a real estate a developer and then he brought a whole block in Houston, Texas in the fifth ward, which at the time was run down, um, like <laughs> prostitution, yeah. um, drugs, stuff like that. And um, he, he changed the whole, the whole face of the block and he put like townhouses up. But what makes him different is that he's not just, you know, bringing people in, just, you know, gentrifying the neighborhood. So what happens a lot of times in, and poor working class neighborhoods is that, you know, people do well for themselves, right? They grow up in a neighborhood, but they might become a doctor, a lawyer, accountant, or whatever, right? Maybe they get a six figure job and then they, they move into the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So the problem with doing that is that now, as we put in the post today, the suburbs, the dollars, it helps their school district. Mm -hmm. It helps their roads, their, their, um, you know, their infrastructure. And meanwhile, the, the hood place you grew up in never gets that. But mm -hmm. what does come is that now people that are not from that neighborhood come into that neighborhood and then they start investing. And now what happens is that the people that the culture actually changes and the people gets pushed mm -hmm. out. So he had the idea like to say, okay, well, why don't we bring the people that are originally from this neighborhood? They got families in this neighborhood that grew up in this neighborhood or just grew up in similar type of neighborhoods mm -hmm. and bring them back. Right. Yeah. So working class professionals, instead of going to the suburbs, come back into the inner city and let's change the culture of it. Like, let's get better schools. Let's get, you know, let's make it a safe environment. Let's mm -hmm. do all that. But let's do it responsibly. So mm -hmm. he, he was like the first person that we really interviewed that had that that strategy. And 
so from now, and I'll let him tell it better than I can, but from from that point until now, he um he brought and sold, he built and sold five homes. He started working on eight. Um, he start he's starting working on eight next month. Um, he purchased 18 houses and two commercial buildings mm-hmm. in March. And um, so he's actually like in the process of actually buying back the block yeah, in, in yeah. real time. It's, so it's fitting because you know, shout out, shout out to Houston. But like when I think of Houston, I think of Scarface and his he had the song My Block. Yeah. I'm looking like yo, Chris really did it. And and just how happens when we went there, we stayed in the fifth ward. Third ward. Third ward. Third ward. Third, third ward. ward. And I was like, yeah. yo, I remember one day we lost, I thought we lost Shotty. I was like, yo, bro, yo, anybody seen Shotty? <laughs> and yo, we couldn't find him. We like, yo, damn, I think somebody followed us to the crib, bro. I think they got him. <laughs> He's like walking like aimlessly down the block, like, this is a nice neighborhood. He's like, you know, what I just saw Chris Senegal. He's scouting. Yeah. Chris be on the street, man. Yeah, they, 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 they thought I got kidnapped. I thought I, we thought he got they, kidnapped. They was running out the house, like, yeah. where, is, where is he? Where's he at? Like, yeah. I'm like, yo, I just took a stroll in the neighborhood, man. <laughs> they, they, they literally thought I got kidnapped in Houston. Right. But um, but yeah, so Chris, um, so what we're gonna do is um I'm gonna let you go through your presentation and all that. But before we even start, um mm-hmm. anything that I missed out as far as the backstory or where you're at now as far as the development, things of that nature? Man, you hit all the important points. I mean, you know, we got two different projects. One is, you know, the new construction, bringing in the higher incomes back to the community. And the other one is that 18 uh, house portfolio I bought is specifically to protect the existing residents. You know, we, we can try to get the city to control the rents or whatever, talk about, you know, stopping gentrification, but we can't stop it. The only way you really control the rents is to own the real estate that the rents come from. And so that's been my focus, man, just trying to show that we can do both sides. Um, so, yes, yeah, so I'll get into a little presentation. We'll talk about that in a second. All right. So let's get into it. So before we start, we're going to um, welcome everybody. So what we do, we do this. We do this once a month at the end of the month. So we have EYL University and um, part of EYL University is that we do weekly classes like we do a class every single week, every Wednesday at eight o'clock Eastern Standard Time. And then at the last Wednesday of each month we open it up for the public so they can like, you know, have like an open house. It's kind of like an open house type deal. Mm-hmm. So what we do with the EYL university classes is that different from the podcast where it's, it's interactive. So a teacher or a presenter comes on and they, um, they give like a 20 minute PowerPoint presentation on it, on their different topics. And then members from EYL university, then they engage with them. They ask questions and it's like an interactive, it's a new way of learning. So what we did with EYL University, we, we think is, is really create a personal finance school, bigger than just investing, because it's like you could just watch Market Mondays just mm-hmm. for investment tips. But EYL University is a whole personal finance school. So like this month, the classes that we had was um, disability insurance. Mm-hmm. We had um, how to start a marijuana company with two thousand mm-hmm. dollars and we had um, car buying class. Um, and then next, next Wednesday, we have the class about Africa real estate, how to invest in Ghana real estate, international real estate. So we got a lot of international people and we want to start doing more international stuff. But even if you live in America, um, Ghana's on fire right now. So each and every week we do, we do a different class. No, November, we got some heat coming. Yeah. We got some heat coming. And then, um, in addition to that, we got the book and movie club. Yep. Headed up by you. Yeah. Yeah. Right now we're doing a uh, money master the game and that's been going crazy every week. I mean, I think we had a record last week. We had like almost 400 people in our book club. It was absolutely amazing. And it's more than a book club. It becomes like this therapeutic session on finance and real estate. And then it becomes like, yo, I found my partners. And inside of that, we have what we call a, uh, triads, which is like three people that are finding ways that they have in common and uh, becoming accountability partners for each other. So it's like, yo, that could be my business partner or it could just be somebody that's pushing me to find my goals or reach my goals. And what we've noticed is like, and this is this is dope. It's like sometimes you tell the person close to you your goals and they don't believe in you. But when you tell a stranger your goals, all they know is your goals. They don't know anything about you but the goal and they try to help you reach. And I think that's one of the beautiful things that we find inside of our, our accountability triad. So it's dope. Yeah. So we got that. Then we got the private Facebook group, which is an investment group. And that's a community within itself. Over 4000 members in there. And then we have um, bi-weekly real estate calls with yeah, MG, the mortgage guy. So every su- every other Sunday, MG, he gets on. It's just like a two hour, three hour, sometimes even four hour, just real estate call. And they just talk about a variety of different real estate calls. And then once a month, I do financial planning calls. Everybody knows I'm a financial advisor. And what happened is that I put my schedule up and it just became too much. It became overwhelming for me to actually take calls. So I limited that. And I realized that a lot of people had the same question. So every single month, sit down for about two hours on a Saturday. 
and um, we talk about financial planning and go yeah. over different stuff, life insurance, retirement, you know, just different financial planning topics. So all of that. And then we have orientation. Orientation. Yeah. Yeah. So every uh, month, now that we get new earners coming in and we treating this like a school, right? EYL University, we have orientation. So some people get, come, they come into it and they're just like overwhelmed by the information. Cause like I said, we're not just capping when we are telling you like there's a lot of courses, a lot of content. So we have an orientation that can help you and guide you through that process, walk you through it, uh, find a track for you, right? Cause some people may say like real estate is not my thing. Well, we got over 70 courses, what is your thing? And so you find a track and you follow it. And that's kind of what makes it dope about having accountability partners and triads is that you're gonna find people who are on similar tracks. So everybody's pushing forward in the same direction, whatever direction you choose. Yeah, that's a fact. So, so yeah, so I say that to say, this is like open house. Once a month we do this open house situation <laughs> and um, it's a lot, it's a lot. So the reason why like the price keeps going on, and it's still undervalued, it's $360 for the entire year, but we're adding to it. So it's an ongoing thing. Mm -hmm. So as we add to it, we have different overhead. We have staff now, we have different, you know, so this, we have, we're running a promo code, 40% mm -hmm. off for the whole entire year, annual membership and $360, which is like I said, that's like a night in Atlanta um, <laughs> for 24 hours, 24 <laughs> hours from, from right now, 24 hours. And then after that, you can still join. It's just, you know, slightly higher membership. It's like a stock. Once yeah, you get in, how we some it. people got it at $99 and it's only going up from there because it's just added value. We're going to make this bigger than um, Phoenix University. Big fact. This, this is going to be the biggest online university in, in existence. So I'm going to put the link in and it's only for the link because we try to make this as easy as possible. There's no code or anything. It's just a link. The link, I'm going to pin the link in YouTube. It's in the, it's in the description. If you want to join 40% off 24 hours. So Chris, let's get into it. Hey. All right, let's go. Let's go. Let me see. Let me share my screen. Does he have to do something to share it or? No, nah, he's a host now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah let me see. I, I got it here. Yeah, Chris is a tech guy, so I know he knows how to do this. <laughs> An engineer in his own right. Yeah. <laughs> Chris is. Okay. Let's see. Yeah, we see you over here. Okay. Let me make sure it's not. Let me see. Slash over from the beginning. There we go. All right. So, how to buy the block. I appreciate the opportunity, guys, for uh, y'all to have me on today. Um, this this topic is very near and dear to me because I've been an investor since 2008. Um, I did the typical fix and flip model, the wholesale model. And what I realized was that, man, sometimes you it's such a capitalistic uh, business and you're trained by other capitalists that don't have the same background as you, that they'll train you to do some things that actually come sometimes can't hurt the community. Um, or or they'll, they'll teach you how to make money in the community, but not actually own the community long term. And so for me, uh, I just had an aha moment one day and I had an epiphany. I was like, well, you know, we, we all, we're always talking about these things that happen in our neighborhoods. And I know other people that look like me that are investors, but nobody is really talking about how to tackle this challenge, um, this gentrification issue. Um, how do we start controlling these neighborhoods again? So um, that's been my mission since about 2012 and 2013 is when I bought that first block that you talked about. Um, so let's just start with the definition of gentrification. The process by which a part of a city changes from being a poorer area to a richer one and people from a higher social class are beginning to move in. Usually if no one advocates for the poorer residents, they become displaced. So let's let's get this out the way. I saw the post that y'all made earlier and I saw the comments uh, under the post and it's like, man, we all know the problems. We, we, all, we all know about slavery. We all know about redlining. We all know about all the other injustices that we have. We, at some point, we got to start focusing on the solutions to these problems, and it's okay to regurgitate them. And it's it's okay to be a debater. It's okay to be a historian. But what about the future? We like, and this quote by Will Smith when he first got on Instagram always resonates with me. It's like, it may not be your fault that something happened to you, but it's damn sure your responsibility to fix it. And so that's exactly where I am. Um, so my mission. Changing the narrative on gentrification through redevelopment that balances the opportunity to attract higher income people originally from similar communities out of the suburbs while ensuring existing residents are not displaced in the process. So let's talk about revitalization plus gentrification, always a debate, okay? So everything has a life cycle, including a neighborhood. It has a life cycle, guys. Um, so it, 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 everything has to start over at some point or either it's just gonna die. You know, you don't, you, we can't just let everything stay where it is. So we either revitalize and have con community control narrative or we stand back and let somebody else do it from the sideline. 
right? And then that's con controlled specifically by outside groups that want profit. And that's what we usually associate with the term gentrification with. So then, you know, like I said, I was doing this back in 2013, 2014, but this trendy phrase came up, you know, about two years ago called buying the block. And I'm like, okay, wait a minute. I guess, I guess that does define what I'm doing. So you, we, are, we are trying to acquire and control the redevelopment of real estate in our historic neighborhoods. So let's, let's talk again about the problems we all know about and the history that we don't think to mention sometimes. All these neighborhoods are disadvantaged for the most part, but they once thrived with people from all economic classes. And what do I mean by that? Well, before desegregation, all of those vacant, rundown commercial buildings you see in these poor neighborhoods used to be vibrant businesses. The doctors, the lawyers, the, 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 the carpenters, the movie theaters, the, the restaurants, everything that we did not have the right to patronize in another community was in these communities. And we patronized all of those things. So let's not think about it as always been uh, a, 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 a horrible place to be. At one point in time, it thrived. Here's another thing to look at. Businesses like grocery stores are scarce in our communities, but when these neighborhoods thrived that during that same time frame, the businesses were actually owned by the people in the community and they were sustainable. So if it happened before, it can happen again. So my goal has been, how do we, how do we go in these neighborhoods? How do we buy the block and do it without displacing the existing residents? So it took me about two or three years to really come up with a model that would work. I, I bought the property in 2013, but I really didn't know what I was gonna do with it. Um, and uh, you know, eventually I, I, I came in and I put these key pieces together. So if we can go in the communities and we can invest in the vacant property in the abandoned property and the neglected property, the, 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 the drug houses, the, the, the houses that, that, that uh, attract criminal activity, right? Not going on, knocking on doors, asking the uh, seniors to sell their house, not taking advantage of people that are you know, in desperate financial, desperate financial situations. Let, let's focus on these properties in the first bullet, number one, number two. Try to keep rental rates affordable if you're going to go in the community and buy rental properties. Okay, that what that means is sometimes you're taught go in and renovate it and make it as nice as possible, which means your investment has to be larger on the front end. In exchange, you have to demand more for the rent, right? But if you can buy a, a, a rental property that's in decent condition and the tenant is happy with the way it is, you don't have to invest so much on the front end. You can still structure a deal where you get a good return if you're a good negotiator where you buy it at the right price. So then the person can stay right there where they are. And the third component is one of the hardest components. How do we prevent home ownership uh, loss uh, due to higher taxes? That's gonna be more of a political play where we have to get with uh, politicians that do this in other, it's, it's already implemented in some cities where if you've owned your home for longer than a certain amount of time, you're exempt from property tax increases. Um, and you know, so that's, that needs to be something that we need to focus on in these communities to make this by the block model really work without uh, being a detriment to the community. Okay, so when is the right time to buy in these neighborhoods? Okay, here's a couple of key points. I'm not talking about a war zone. I'm not talking, <laughs> about, I'm not talking about anywhere still in super hood, you know. Uh, we, we are talking about areas and communities where um, there's already some sign of something positive happening, okay. Um, and just remember, it, even if you see an abandoned community that, that looks like it has a lot of potential, bullet number two is very important. It's harder for you to, to spark this revitalization and get a return on your investment if you are the only catalyst. You have to go in the communities where there's already something kind of going on and we still have an opportunity to step in front of it. And instead of trying to stop you know, the redevelopment and calling it gentrification. Let's participate in it. Let's control the narrative. Let's control parts of everything that's going on in the community. Okay. Uh, so things you want to look for when you see announcements of projects in the newspaper, on the news, um, city council meetings, um, from other people that are in real estate that you know, people that are networking with, with developers or builders, um, people you know in your community that are, that are uh, investors. You know, when you hear these types of announcements, and that, that, that lets you know something is coming. You know, the second uh, Burger King figures out where McDonald's put a, a land purchase contract in, they're going to try to buy land right next to them, right? Same thing with Walgreens and CVS. So as the smaller guys in this play, as we're trying to independently control and buy back these blocks, we need to be following the big boys, you know? It's gonna happen, we can't fight them, we can't stop them, so we might as well participate. Another good thing to look at is the city activity. Uh, when, 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 
when a uh, city activity picks up in a neighborhood um, on the private real estate side, okay? When a particular neighborhood where you didn't see any new construction before, now you start seeing it for sale signs and you see active construction work going on, that's probably a good community, especially if it's one of our communities. Um, that's a good time for you to start saying, okay, this might be a neighborhood that I might wanna look at trying to buy the block with, okay? And then the city initiatives to spark redevelopment, that's on the public side. So when you see, when you see the city going to community and they're repaving streets and they're putting in sidewalks and they're updating signs and they're putting in bike paths, they're doing all of that because that's kind of the extent that the, that the public, uh, the government can do to entice developers. They want developers to see this and investors to see this and say, okay, this is a neighborhood I wanna be in. So if you look for these signs before all the houses have gone up and before everything looks nice, these are neighborhoods that, you, that we should be trying to buy the block in, especially if they are communities. So how do we successfully execute buying back the block? Okay, so number one, when it comes to uh, buying blocks, if you're gonna do something bigger than individual houses, you don't wanna get a big plan together. You don't wanna spin your wheels on things if you do not have site control. Site control is the single most important part of that process because what happens is you put this tremendous plan together and either the seller decides they don't wanna sell um, or you don't have all of the properties together that you need for the project uh, or they, they get wind of something else and they, they increase their price on you. Um, and so all of these factors will end up with you doing all this work, all this planning, and then you have no property to actually use it for. So all that time and money is wasted, right? So there's several ways you get site control. Number one, just make sure you have the property under a solid contract at a set purchase price with a certain time frame on it, okay? That way, um, if, if it's one piece of property that you need for this entire project, then you know you have control of that. Number two is kind of you know obvious, outright purchase, but that's not practical in most situations. Just going out and buying a whole block and paying for it cash is not really practical. Um, and then the third one is an option to purchase. So if you have a, a project that you want to, that you want to uh, take on, and let's say it's five or six different owners, seven different owners, and you don't know if all of them are going to want to sell. You don't know um, if their price points are going to be reasonable if they do want to sell. What you want to do is execute options to purchase. And what that is, is you go from owner to owner and you say, hey, Mr. Owner, um, let's negotiate. Let's come to a price that we both agree on. I'm not buying your property today. But if you give me a year, you give me two years um, and I can pull this thing together that I'm trying to do, you have to allow me to buy your property at this price. OK, in exchange for that. I'm going to give you this money. Could be $1,000, could be $500, whatever. Hey, if you never hear from him again, this is your $1,000. You know, but if I come back to you uh, in a year and I'm ready to buy, then we have to follow through on this contract. And so that allows you to control each individual parcel until you get them all together for the project that you're trying to do. Okay, next most important step is planning and design because you have to really understand what it's going to take to pull this concept off that you're trying to implement. Now, if you're buying a, a, if you're trying to buy more than one property and there are rental properties, like I said earlier, and there's already tenants there, then you know this process is going to be a lot easier for you because you don't have a lot of work to do on the front end, right? You don't have a lot of expenses that in, in the real estate development world is called soft costs. These are things that are intangible. Like once you spend the money, the money's gone. Once you pay an architect for design work, whether the project gets started or not. That's gone, right? Um, the permitting fees, uh, paying for engineers, all that kind of stuff. Um, construction, of course, construction is going to be one of your biggest expenses because you want to make sure that while you have site control, you really understand what the cost of this entire project is going to be. Um, and then you want to make sure that planning and zoning and city ordinance or whatever in your area and just the, the general uh, city permit approvals are in place for you to be able to execute your project. And most importantly, all of this is really that, all of that comprises feasibility of rather buying this block and doing whatever you plan to do with it really makes sense. Okay, now, so after you get site control and you've got a good plan together, then you have to figure out how you're actually gonna take down the project and how you're gonna start the project. So my number one go-to is what's been working for me in Houston is seller financing. If I would have waited in 2013 for a bank to tell me that I was bankable to buy a whole block and I was waiting for a bank to tell me that a block in the hood was worth a certain amount of money 
when there were no recent sales and it was full of crime and, and drug infestation, you know, I would have never got that project off the ground. So, but what happens when you go to somebody that owns the property outright, okay? That means it's probably been in their family longer than 30 years or it's maybe passed down from generation to generation and they have the right, the free and clear right to do whatever they want the property, you can negotiate with them. And um, so for one of my properties, I'm gonna show you in a case study, one of them I negotiated 10% down to buy a whole block. The second one I had to come to the table with 50% of the agreed upon purchase price. But then you make payments to them instead of making payments to a bank. And they're not gonna check your credit score. They're not gonna do a background check. They're not gonna ask you about other things because when sellers finance something directly to you, they know that if you default, they can just take the property back and they can start the process over, do the same thing again, right? So that's a trick. Well, that's not, not really a trick, but that's a technique that we need to implement more often when we're trying to get in our communities and do these things. So something else, if they don't agree to that, or if they do agree to that, but you don't have enough money for the down payment, start off with a small group of investors. Um, maybe I would always suggest you have somebody on your team that's experienced with, uh, with, with investing um, and you know have them come on a team and help you through the process. Um, I, I highly, I, I highly suggest you don't do it if you're all newbies and you have nobody on the team because what may seem like a good deal may not be a good deal. And then third is crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is what I did for one of my projects, but I didn't do a crowdfund until I've been in real estate investing for almost 13 years. Okay, so a lot of people ask about it, but when you take other people's money, you know, and you and you and, and you are trying to complete a project. All those bullet points before that got to be spot on because people are not giving you donations. They are giving you money and they are expecting their money back and they're expecting a profit on top of that. So, you know, you got to be really careful when you get in that round. Um, and most importantly of all of these things is the right team. You can have the right plan. Um, you can have all every, every box checked, but if you don't have the right team to execute on buying back the block, um, you, you, it'll be very hard for you to be successful. Now, the most important key is that we all have to participate. And this is what I mean by that. The investors need to be participating in this, okay? We need to be actively looking to buy in our communities, okay? If you're a landlord, may maybe you don't want to actually live in the community, but you're, you have rental properties. You should be trying to control rental properties in these same neighborhoods. Um, and you can maybe, maybe one investor has bought the block and renovated the block, and now they're selling the homes to, to other people. Well, you as an investor should come in and buy some of the properties from that developer so that the, the ownership transfers from us to us, right? And then you, as someone who looks like the community, should be looking out for people in the community and have a, a vested interest in not being a slumlord and taking care of the community. Of course, realtors play an integral part in this. Why? Because when you have buyers, when you have investors, when you have renters, you should be telling them about all of the investors, landlords, developers, builders you know in the community and trying to steer them to the to these neighborhoods first. Once again, I'm not talking about war zones. Okay, I'm talking about areas that there's already some sign of revitalization. And lastly, and most importantly, the, the, the regular buyers, like for my development um, that I'm gonna show you in a second, all of my buyers look like us, young working professionals. It's not, it's not as bad, it's not the hood that sometimes people say it is. You, you, you have to be very aware of what outside narratives are versus what's really there. So as a buyer, if you're in a community and some of those other signs have already talked about are happening, if you see redevelopment starting, if you see a lot of activity in the community, if you see the city putting things in, guess what? That city's already got that neighborhood on their radar. Even though it may not be perfect yet, it's coming. And usually what happens is we go to the community one day and it's the hood and we go back a year later and it's million dollar homes and we're like, what happened? And we're mad and it's gentrification. It's like, no, what really happened was from the time you left, other people saw value in their community and they started buying. And not everybody's buying rental properties. People are really moving in their community. They're walking their dogs, they're riding their bikes and the values are steadily going up, steadily going up. And then by the time we get wind of what's going on in the community, the prices are so high, we can't afford it, right? So that's usually what happens. So, Troy Rashad, I, I know I'm talking a lot, man. I, that that uh, was, that uh, was uh, you, got, you got it, man. Uh, I, I'm actually could. taking notes. <laughs> I hope, I hope, I, yeah, I hope everybody on YouTube, please hit the like button. And I hope people greatly appreciate this because it's like nobody's doing this. Like nobody, and that's the reason why we created EYL University. Like I said, it's a, it's a business school 
But do you know you don't learn this stuff in business school? No, this right? is I mean, and this is just the beginning. Like he still got more to talk about. But it's like people talk about buy the black, buy back the block. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. How do you, like what does that mean? Right? How, how, like, why are we even calling? Yeah. Block so this is like, know. all right, this is this is a step by step blueprint from somebody that has is actually doing it and has actually done it. So now nah, keep going, bro. Chris, Chris real, real quick. So yeah. um, yeah. some of those signs. Are there any other type of retail? Uh, or c- commercial real estate that we should be looking for for a sign. I, I know somebody in the chat said, "Yo, when you see a Starbucks or w- when." So you- usually, so you, so that's something else that we have a misconception about, right? So mm-hmm. usually, like we get mad when grocery stores and those types of businesses leave the community, but those businesses have whole departments that before they buy, before they figure out where their location, their site selection team pulls the demographics, and they say, "What's the average income in this community? Mm-hmm. Do these people?" earn enough and do they have enough disposable income to support our business, right? So you're not gonna see commercial signs going in until almost till it's too late because all the incomes in that area are already gonna be so high and they're gonna be buying houses at such high prices and, and you know, the price is gonna continue to go up that it becomes priced out for us. So what, and, and the way re- development usually works is the rooftops come first, the houses come first, the, the new residents with the higher incomes come in first. And the only way you get ahead of that wave is by looking at those signs that I told you earlier. But yeah, mm-hmm. if you, if you, it's almost like if you see a Starbucks, it's almost too late. Yeah. <laughs> it made me think like Whole Foods don't end up in every neighborhood. You know what I mean? Right, they don't. And people don't, <laughs> speaking of Whole Foods, people don't realize like a grocery store has the lowest profit margins of almost any business. It's usually three to 5%. So they're not going to go in a neighborhood. Even if the city gives them all the money to build the facility, they still have to have, they have, have to float every month. They got to be operating positive, right? So, I mean, the grocery stores, the highest profitability is um, on the fresh produce, on the meats, and the stuff on the shelves um, that is not really very profitable. So if you're in a community where people are buying everything off the shelf in the cans and in the boxes, and you got this huge overhead from all these employees, and you got this huge overhead from this huge lease you got, and you got this high utility bill, you know, it's, it's, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be profitable if you try to go into one of those neighborhoods for the sake of, uh, you know, social service, right? They, I mean, they they have to run a business at the end of the day. Yeah, so. and um, YouTube, if you could like this, two things I need from YouTube. Everybody like, we got 997 people. There's no reason why we shouldn't have 997 <laughs> likes. <laughs> if, 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 if you didn't like it, just politely comment why you why you thought the information wasn't valuable enough to like. It doesn't even cost anything. Doesn't even, <laughs> won't even burn a calorie. <laughs> and then also um, share it with somebody. Just go, like this is life change and generational change in information that we, you know, giving out right now. Like, you know, share it with people. And shout out to MG the Mortgage Guy and shout out to Brandon Rule, Be Rule. legend himself. And shout out to Andre Hatchett, the first teacher that we ever had for EYL University. That's, a fact. That's my guy, man, for sure. Yeah, and got a um, bunch of legends in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. For, sure, for sure, for sure. So, all right, Chris. And then somebody said on, on YouTube, it was like a fifth ward is into hood hood. Yeah, that's kind of the whole point of what he said. Like, you don't want to go into the most <laughs> right. Right. Sli- slightly dangerous. You don't yeah, want right. to, you don't, you don't want to invest in a full war zone. Like, nah, sli- s- slightly dangerous. Like yeah, that. yeah. I mean, slightly, it's, slightly. it's something where the, 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 you know, the criminal, criminal activity is going down significantly. And there's more police patrols coming and all that kind of stuff. You know, you you, you have to be there. So I mean, that's the only way you really participate. In. And I understand the people that have like young kids or feel uncomfortable in those situations. Yeah, we're, I'm not saying I'm not forcing you to. I'm just saying with my projects, I have buyers that specifically chose to come to the communities and they have had zero issues. Like they have had not a single issue. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all about perspective. And we talk about schools and education a lot. Uh, thankfully, in a big city like Houston, there's a lot of charter schools, a lot of private schools. So you have alternatives to the public school system until that public school system catches up in that neighborhood. But in the same time, you think about this. If you buy. OK, I'll give you an example. Um, there was a lady that went to the third ward, like the hood part of third ward, worse than where, where y'all stayed. But the first house had been renovated. Uh, middle aged white lady uh, was like one of the last people walking out of an open house. And my boy was there and he said that. Um, 90% of the people that walked through this open house in the hood part of third ward were white. So he said that curiosity got the best of him. He stopped her and asked her, he's like, why are you here? And what, what attracts you to this area? She's like, oh, well, I bought my house in the Heights in, which is another neighborhood that's been gentrified for about 15, 16 years. She's like, I bought my house in the Heights about 15 years ago and the neighborhood looked just like this. And my property value is going up $300,000. So I'm about to sell that house and come over here and do the same thing. And I'm like, well, man, imagine if more of us thought about that 
imagine what what the average household income or the average average household net worth would be for our community and imagine how many of our children we could pay to go to college out of the equity in our homes mm-hmm. if we thought like that mm-hmm. that's a lot of information that's mm-hmm. that's a that's a gem right there really man that's a gem right there yo, we gotta get to houston man yeah. <laughs> i can't wait to come I, back to houston yeah, we got, yo mr dunlap we're paging you <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah all I'm, right. I'm gonna run through the case studies real quick all right um, let's, let's do it so let's talk about Fifth Ward. People are talking about it's not the hood. So let, 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 let's go through it. So settled in the middle 1800s, believe it or not, um, middle 1800s to 1900, it was actually half mi- It was mixed uh, white and black. Um, it was annexed into the city 1866. By 1900, it's a predominantly black neighborhood with thriving businesses. And don't believe me, let me show you. This is Lyons Avenue. This is the same street that one of my projects was on. This is, this is from the 50s on Lyons Avenue. You see all types of businesses all up and down the street and you see who's walking up and down the street. This was a segregated neighborhood at that point in time. Okay, this is the other way down the same street. I mean, I see tailors, I see movie theaters, I see pawn shops, you know, I see restaurants, everything's in the community, right? But then in the 1960s when desegregation happened, um, two major freeways came through the community, of course, all these negative impacts uh, caused a lot of disinvestment and then some of the redlining impacts also uh, hurt the community. And by the 1970s, there was a mass exodus of the majority of successful people. The business owners, had a lot of them had closed up shop because the patronage had gone down, the customers had moved out. Um, and so the communities no longer thrived. Um, but what that did is that that opened up opportunity for other people to come into the community. However, these are some of the other highlights, like the picture at the bottom on the right was uh, the first uh, black hospital built in Fifth Ward, actually in Houston. That we had, we had, uh, you know, our own re- recording studios. I mean, you know, these neighborhoods were thriving. So that that's the part that I, I want people to remember when we think about these neighborhoods. Um, they they used to be great. If we had a Black Wall Street in every city, because we had to create our own, we we couldn't we couldn't patronize other other uh, other neighborhoods. So this is the freeway that kind of came through. This is the same street in the same vicinity, like one block off. But you see now, the only thing that's left. Thankfully, the churches are still there, but the neighborhood is. Uh, a lot less activity going on. A lot, a lot of the buildings are gone now. So this is the property that I bought, which is in Fifth Ward. That's the same freeway that you see in the back on the left side, Highway 59. So in 2014, I, I did what I was telling everybody to do earlier. I was watching the city trends. I was watching redevelopment and it was going counterclockwise around downtown. And this was the last neighborhood that had not been uh, touched by redevelopment or gentrification. So I was able to negotiate with this owner to buy this entire block for uh, for half a million dollars and negotiate 10% down, okay? So I actually sold a couple of rental properties. I had an investor put in a little bit um, and I took control of this property. Everybody thought I was crazy. They, this was still the bloody nickel at that point in time, but I knew, I knew uh, just by watching the redevelopment trend, eventually it was gonna come because this was like literally the last quadrant around downtown that had not been redeveloped, okay? So I actually paid over market value. Here's why. There were no sales. There was no comps. So if you looked at the tax records, that's the only thing you can go off of. It had the, the whole property worth about 350000 But what I knew, taking a calculated risk by watching the redevelopment is like, well, if I'm not paying cash for it and I'm only giving him 50000 right now and I'm, I'm financing it for 20, 30 years, it's highly likely that by the time I get even close to paying this off, the value will have caught up and exceeded it. So what that does is it almost puts you in a position where you're like kind of partnering with the owners. You know, you're telling them you're going to give them a little bit more over time than what the property is currently worth, but you have everything calculated. And you know that by the time you, you, you make whatever move you're going to make, the value will have caught up and you will have equity on the back end. So, okay, so I talked about this already. So 2014 is when I bought it. 2016, the bet paid off. 2016, this is the south end of Fifth Ward. Uh, one of the biggest developers in Houston bought 136 acres that used to be KBR, used to be the national defense contractor, um, right next to downtown, right on the water in what we considered the hood. But of course, they always find value when, you know, when we don't find value. And they, they put this big plan together to do this massive project. And so that was the first catalyst in the community. So this again, this is this is the project site that they got. You see where downtown is, and the star is where both of my projects are. So one of my projects is right here, the new construction townhome project where the where the grocery store is is right there. 
Now that's one mile radius. This one is like a little, little bit more than three quarters of a mile radius where the other project is, okay? This is what's gonna be built on that site. This is not speculation. This is what's gonna be there. Mm. Okay, they've already, they've already cleared all of the old buildings. They've already done all the underground infrastructure. They've run all the utilities. They, they did slow down a little bit because of COVID um, and some of the lumber price and stuff going up, but the CEO said they're still moving forward with the project. So after that happened in 2016, here's another creative technique you can use. I talked the owner into uh, converting from a owner finance note, which is like a mortgage note to partnering with me. So what I said was, look, I still owe you like 300,000. Um, you can wait the next 20 years to get it, or you can partner with me on this project and let me figure out how I can do some new construction. And then I can pay you out as I sell these houses on the back end and you can be paid off in three or four years instead mm. of waiting 30 years. Okay, so he agreed. So what did that do? That took the mortgage off of the property. So now I am the primary, uh, the primary partner. He's a limited partner. And I have this property. I can now go to the bank and say it's free and clear. I don't have any debt on it. <laughs> right. So then I use the property as collateral as I started shopping to get the loans to do the redevelopment. But the downside, of course, what I talked about earlier, I had to go through 23 different lenders before I got approved. No matter how great my plan was, there was no established marketability in this neighborhood because there, there was no new construction, um, even though the redevelopment was that close. Um, it was really hard for me to find a lender that would uh, that would partner with me on a project. So, you know, I had a private investor come in and put in uh, a IRA money, two hundred fifty thousand. Um, she she's young uh, black uh, chick that worked for um, oil and gas company, worked for Shell for a while. She had a nice IRA that she was uh, that she wasn't using. It was sitting in the stock market, and you know, I showed her the vision. She believed in it. And she was like, okay, cool. I didn't take her money and spend it. I, I took it and put it in a bank account to show interest reserves to hope to hopefully that would try to sweeten the deal with the lender. So and, and, and Chris, not to cut you off, but yeah, we, we did a we did a class on self-directed IRAs too at yeah. university. And um, I'm not sure if that's a path you went, but a lot of people don't even realize that you can actually use your retirement accounts like an IRA to invest in real estate without paying taxes. So I just wanted to throw that in there since you, since you nah, have the IRA. Nah, that's, that's exactly right. When you have a self-directed IRA, you can invest in any asset that you choose and it's literally self-directed. You just have a, a, a company that's a, basically a custodian for you to help you check boxes, but yeah, you can, you can invest it however you want. So that's something that you can leverage in real estate. Um, so like, like I said, there was challenges with new, no new construction. Also, when I got ready to start the project, what I realized is like a lot of these older neighborhoods, there's a lack of utility infrastructure. So this old grocery store didn't have much plumbing, you know, it wasn't drawing much electricity. Um, and when I got ready to do my new project, I realized that the city was gonna require me to update a lot of this infrastructure. So that's something else you gotta think about if you're planning on doing projects on this scale. Um, it's something that you usually don't think about when you're just flipping a house or building one or two houses on a, on a lot, because usually that what you're building will not impact the infrastructure greatly. But when you're trying to do a bigger project, you do have to consider those things. So this talks about more 2017. Now redevelopment. Remember that first neighborhood I, call, I told y'all about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Heights? Now, see 2017, three years later, it's in the newspaper. They call in Fifth Ward, the new Heights. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it happens once they start that's renaming that. neighborhoods once i've seen so bro yeah so bro you know what so bro is no what's that south bronx oh south bronx yeah, <laughs> yeah. south bronx that's, that, that was one of the most dangerous neighborhoods the poor one of the most poorest neighborhoods in, the in america one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in america it's still not the greatest but yeah when they started naming it so bro yeah. and they put like right. a whole pools and all yeah. of that it's like all right Yep. 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 Same thing with Dumbo. Say that because the official yeah. name for that for that South in the Fifth Ward now they're calling it North Edo, which is east of downtown. So yep. Yeah, that's another that's another thing too. Once you start to see names, because it's like even yeah. um um Noha, I think it was um North Ma North Manhattan, no um no something. No, no, that was um Houston. You talking about North Houston? No, 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 no. They they had it. They 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 try to rename Harlem um something wow. where it was like North Manhattan. No ho there. No. Nope. Yeah, and um, 
So once they start to get funny with those names, like Sobro, Noho, mm-hmm. that's like the hipsters. They trying to they trying to rebrand it. Yeah, yeah. They trying try to rebrand the community. Don't, those are part of the you were they talking the about. Old name has a stigma. They, the old name has a stigma, so they want to try to, like you said, rebrand it. Yeah, so that that's part of the announcement. So when you were talking about announcements, when you start seeing things like that, I saw somewhere, and and, and you can correct me if I'm if I'm wrong, but they they named uh, the Fifth World. They have a cultural arts district. Yes, yes. Now, now, thankfully, with this with this time, it was us doing that. So okay. the Fifth World Redevelopment Corporation did that cultural arts district, and it's it's gonna. You're right. It's gonna be the first African American cultural arts district in Houston. Perfect. So, perfect. Yeah, man. So and that's what I'm saying. This neighborhood, they they've been staying ahead of you know. Not not playing victim and being behind. They've been in front of the eight ball, so it's been really good. So this this goes back to this, this is the CEO recently in August, you know, amidst COVID, just saying that the project is still going forward, right? So this is that same block. This mm-hmm. is this, this this is the same block that I showed y'all earlier. Um, that's what it looks like now. And that's your that, that's your block. Those, those that's your block, man. Block. You know so that, we, yeah, we, yeah, nah, you we pulled take, up on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. By so, YouTube, man, so, put the put the put the clap in the mode. I just want to, nah, you guys celebrate that, man, because yeah, I wish we could do a side by side. But that block that he brought earlier, you, yeah. Um, Let me go back to it. Yeah, can you go back to that? Yeah, that. that so that block, you brought that block, yeah. and then how many years later? Uh, so 2014, and then 2019, 2018, when when I first started building them. So 2019, they were the, the first three were done. I think that's when I was on y'all show last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, people told me that they were like, "Man, nobody's gonna buy that." You know, nobody's gonna want to live in the neighborhood. Um, you know, you're not gonna be able to get the prices that you're thinking you're gonna get for them. And I mean, I, I proved everybody wrong. Uh, we, I got, I got full asking price. All the buyers look like me. Everybody, I didn't have to oversell anybody. There's enough of us that see the value of moving back to our communities. Um, that you know, it, it 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 it's worth it. It's worth it's worth taking a shot. It's worth uh, rebuilding and bringing people back to the community. Man, one of one of the most powerful experiences I had was when I was under construction. Um, it's two two black kids walked down the street. Two boys. They were like maybe 13, 14, something like that. And they're like, "Man, are you building rent houses?" And I'm like, "No." I'm, he's 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 like uh, he's like you you work for the uh, the person that's building these. I'm like, "No, I'm building them." He's like, "Oh, okay." He's like, "Who gonna buy these?" I was like, well, who do you think is going to buy them? He's like, well, they look like, it looked like white people going to buy them. <laughs> and I was like, man, you know, you know, well, you'll be surprised. young like, man, no, there's people that look like you that can also afford these types of things. And I was like, I had two of them under contract already. I was like, so actually the first two buyers are people that come from a neighborhood just like you and went to college and, you know, they have good jobs now. And now they're coming back and buying this. And they were like, man, we didn't know that was possible. But, you know, that sounds, sounds kind of cliche. But there's, there's kids in that community that now have a positive re- representation. They can see people that look like them, that's our age, pulling out their driveways and Porsches and, and Audis and BMWs and look like them. That's the representation they didn't have before. The only representation they had of successful people was illegal entrepreneurs, you know? <laughs> yeah. so, but that's all a part of buying the block, man. It's not just about you buying and you being an investor and just holding it onto it. It's about creating opportunities like this as uh, being in a development and building and, 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 inquire, and uh, enticing other people to come back to the community. So that's amazing. Yeah. So fast forward. This is Fifth Ward now. You see all these prices over here, right? For $400,000. Now, when I bought that first block, you couldn't, you couldn't sell a lot for $20,000. It would just sit. But now you have all this activity. Um, the yellow ones are pending, the, the, the green, the new listings, and there's a bunch of souls that are, that are in the community. But four hundred thousand dollars, you know, um, and up. So this is one of one of the articles that they, they put me in the paper for, just talking about my projects. This is not talking about the second project. Um, so let's go back to the highway story. Um, so this this block right here is the second project. This is the eighteen houses I was talking about with the two commercial buildings. This is that same freeway once again, an infamous freeway. So you know we, we can continue to talk about these things and and complain about them. Or we can say, okay, we know this is there. We know this happened. Now, what are we going to do about it, right? It's, it's our responsibility to fix the problem. So the, the owners of this, the landlords, um, they had had this for about 20 years and they were, uh, they were, they were ready to retire. So not all landlords pass property down. That's another myth. Uh, real estate is not generational wealth unless you have taught your kids how to do systems and they see that it's worthwhile for them to take over that same investment, that same vehicle. In this case, the kids did not want to take over it. So the parents were told that they should sell it, okay? So 
uh, and what would have happened if I didn't buy it because all, all that redevelopment, by the way, all those new townhomes, if you see my cursor up in the left corner, that's right there. That's all that new construction right there. So had I not bought it, uh, an investor outside the community would have bought it and they would have done a couple of things. They would have came in and, you know, did the deep renovations the you know, and then raise the rents and if tenants can't afford it, oh well, or they would have held it for a little while, decided to tear it down and build some new construction here. But for me, this was an opportunity to say, okay, on that other block, I bought that old abandoned grocery store and that site, I brought new construction in. Now I can show the other side of buying the block. We can buy the block and make sure we preserve the, 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 the lifestyles and the, the sense of normalcy that the residents have that have been here long-term. So the way you, you can do a project like this is since it's so close to redevelopment, it's so close to the catalyst that I talked about earlier, is that you can get your return on your investment through value appreciation. OK, because this property value is going to go up significantly. So you don't have to worry so much about cash flow solely where you have to raise the rents astronomically to get the return. This property value is going to double or triple. Um, but, you know, conservatively, conservatively, I'm saying it's going to go up 30 to 40 percent. But every other neighborhood that's been gentrified, lots that were worth 250, I mean, were, were worth 25,000 are now worth 250,000. So for this one, this is the one I actually got to do the crowdfund on. Um, so what I did with the crowdfund, I'll go back to this slide. Um, the crowdfund is once I negotiated with the sellers the, to, uh, to the purchase price, they wanted 1.5 million for the whole block. Uh, I negotiated them down to 1.25. So I, I, I negotiated them down a quarter of a million. Um, and, you know, what happened was since they, they were sellers and, you know, they really didn't have accounting and all that kind of stuff. It, I told them, you know, even if you wanted to, uh, if you wanted me to pay 1.5 for it, I couldn't go to a bank and get a $1.5 million valuation because you don't, you know, there's no accounting records to show what the true revenue is for the property. There's not a lot of sales in the community. So, um, you know, what I would like to do is get you to, to, you know, come down a little bit off of that price um, and work with me over a few years. Let me establish the accounting records. Let me establish all these things. And then I can go back and refinance. And one, and then once the bank sees the, the, you know, the records, they can, extract a true value for that entire block and it'll be much easier for me to get them to give me 650,000 which is half of the purchase price than it would be for me to go and ask them for 1.5 million right now and so that's the kind of conversations you have to have with sellers sometimes to, if you want to get creative and they bought in um you know so they owner financed it they they wouldn't take 10 percent. they wouldn't take 20 percent down so <laughs> so they wanted something significant so 50 percent um so what i did with that was First, I secured a private investor that I knew that could back me um, on bringing the majority of that, that uh, down payment to, to closing if I couldn't raise it. But once I secured that, th this is the opportunity that I decided it was okay to do a crowdfund with. Because the crowdfund, like I talked about earlier, um, it requires you to have all your, your I's dotted and your T's crossed um, because you're going to take outside people's money. And so with this, some of these residents in these houses have been living there for 20 years, literally. Um, there's there's mother daughters that live in separate houses on the property. There's niece and uncle that live next door to each other, um, and you know these are long term stable tenants, um, all all African American. Um, some of them, most of them, um, actually all of them, hardworking. I don't. There's no. There's really no Section Eight tenants here. These are people that are just hardworking but on fixed incomes, right? Um, so. Uh, for that, that made a good base case for me. It's like, okay, there's long-term stable revenue coming from the residential side of this property. These two commercial buildings over here were vacant. So that gives me upside, right? So I can buy it, know I'm gonna have all this revenue, which is about 9,000, almost $10,000 a month coming from here. And then I can go in and renovate these two and bring in another seven, $8,000 a month in revenue on the commercial side. Hmm. So that's what I did. So that's how I decided to package it up. And I decided to do a crowdfund and, um, you know, I didn't know how successful the crowdfund was going to be, but it ended up being extremely successful. Uh, the most you can raise with this type of crowdfund and it's SEC regulated is a million and 70,000. And it took me seven months and we hit that, we hit that goal. So that gave us enough money to go in and renovate everything and pay off the, uh, the short term debt um, with, uh, with the bridge loan, because I did have to close on it in March, which was before I had raised the full 600,000. So I ended up using some of the private investors' money, but not all of it. 
So this is what the properties looked like before. Again, the tenants had been there long term. They were happy with it. So what I did was I just to reinforce that we were there to protect them and, you know, we were going to be good landlords. Um, I went and I did some slight renovations to the property just to make them feel better. So this is what it looks like now. I came in, I did landscaping. I put screens on everybody's windows to help with their utility bills um, and paint, repainted everything. Just made it look nice and neat. And you can see the bottom picture I actually repaved everything to give it a fresh new look. Uh, this is the status of one of the commercial buildings. So this is going to be short term pier space. So this is what it looked like before. It looked like it was almost tear down worthy, you know, but we, we took it back to the bones. And now this is what it looks like. This is what it looked like on the inside before. And so this is what it looks like now. Uh, what This is what it looked like a couple of weeks ago under renovations. And this is closer. This is what it looks like now. So I'm almost done with it. Uh, you know, this is going to be. So it's, think Airbnb, but for business uses, short-term business uses, um, event space or like office spaces, et cetera, et cetera. And then this is the other building. This is the building down here in the corner where we, we've got it gutted back uh, to the studs and we're getting ready to bring it back. It's probably going to be an event space for now. And then we're probably going to turn into a coffee shop in a year or two. Um, we had coffee shop as the original concept because of COVID. I don't want to take all that additional in additional capital and invest in something that may not uh, secure a tenant right away. So it's something like event spaces where you just, I'm just building it back out to basically what they call in commercial real estate, just a box, right? So white floors, white walls and lighting and open space so people can rent it and use it like that. And we can generate revenue off of it uh, without having to have a significant investment. So yeah, man. Um, and this is, this is what you're talking about, Troy, the culture arts district. Yeah. So, so the whole street, this whole street with Fifth Ward Community Redevelopment Corporation got disapproved to be a culture arts district. Um, so yeah, so, and th this project, this crowdfunded project is right here in the heart of it, right off of the freeway. So that's another upside for uh, having ownership in this community because there's gonna be a lot of uh, public money coming into the community now because it's a cultural arts district. So yeah, man, so that's it. That's, that's what I got for you. That's incredible. Uh, I appreciate it. Yep. I, asked, I asked Chris to put together a presentation. <laughs> that was... I didn't know he was going to do a whole... <laughs> <laughs> man, that was that was extremely impressive, man. I, I really, I really, 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 really appreciate that. That was that was extremely, extremely impressive. Well, no, that, much that, appreciated, man. Much appreciated, man. And trust me, I can go hours on each one of those slides. So I, I tried to keep it short. <laughs> <laughs> now you know what the thing about it is, and we're gonna go into the best part of, of the whole situation when people get to ask questions and answer the questions. But um, it's like you know we're in a political season right now, and. Obviously, everybody should go out there and vote for, you know, whatever you think is the right situation to, to do. But nobody's coming to save you either way. Right. You can't, you can't rely sure. on you can't rely on government programs. You can't rely on any type of, you know, opportunity zone, government assistance to help build. Like right. at the end of the day, human human nature is self-preservation hmm. and people people are um, tribal by nature. And, and, and they look out for their own tribe. So it's unrealistic to expect anybody to come uh, better our situation as a community. This is why we have to do it ourselves. So when we just you know give you the whole blueprint about how he built, how he's buying back the block in Houston, Texas, he's doing it like hook a crook. Yeah. And the thing about it is like, when he, when he, um, he just laid out like two different things. Cause like the first one he did with just private money, the, um, the woman that had the, the, the IRA and then he put some money down. Then the second time he did the crowdfunding. So he's giving you multiple different, like on that first slide where it was like, you can do it yourself. You can do a bank finance and you could do crowdfunding. Like he's yeah. giving you different things and he actually did different things. And it's like, it's not like he's coming from, you know, millions of dollars and got a million dollar loan and bank loans and all that stuff. It's like, we can make excuses or we can, we can get it done and we can, um, you know, change the direction of our, of our family and our legacy. And that's mm -hmm. what I really like about you. Mm -hmm. is like, you're not making excuses. Mm -hmm. You just out here, just, just doing getting it. it done, man. We, getting we, it done. we ain't throwing the word legend around lightly, man. We, we talking to a real legend and I'm glad you said opportunity zones. Cause Chris, I heard you say something that I've never heard before. Mm -hmm. And we kind of explained what opportunity zones were and shout out to our brother, MG, the mortgage guy. We did a whole segment on that. Mm -hmm. But you said they kind of really don't benefit us, obviously, because you have to have capital gains. But you said mm -hmm. something very interesting. You said the process of moving your business into an opportunity zone could benefit us. Can you talk about mm -hmm. that just a little bit? Yeah. So. Um, so the way it works is, um, well, I think you have to acquire a business outside of an opportunity zone or you have to have investors. OK, 
let me let me back up. So yeah, so if you personally acquire a business um, that's outside of an opportunity zone and then you move it into an opportunity zone, you get the same tax benefits as uh, the people that are investing in real estate in those zones. Um, you can also have investors invest in a business for you to buy and then you relocate into an opportunity zone and those investors get those same tax benefits. Um, and like you said, opportunity zones aren't really made for us because you have to have capital gains. So the way that you that you you do benefit from it is you get investors to invest either in your real estate or your businesses. Get those those folks that do have capital gains to invest in your businesses, and then while you you may get a small portion of the actual returns from the investment, you, you know you uh, you have the ability to leverage all of their capital for whatever project you're trying to get done. There you have it. So we're going to jump into it. Can you can you hang out with us a little bit longer? Yeah, definitely. Answer some question. All right. So we're going we're gonna to answer questions. So before we do that, anybody that came on late. So what we're doing right now, if if you're wondering why we're doing like this special YouTube live, EYL University is a platform that we built and um, we do weekly webinars. We do this like we do classes like this every single week and every Wednesday at eight o'clock Eastern Standard. And the last Wednesday of the month, we open it up to the public, we put it on YouTube. So it's like an open house. Like, you know, I, we feel like the best way to kind of, you know, put the product on display is for people to walk through, try mm -hmm. it out, right? We have nothing to hide. So um, this is this is just what that is. So, and outside of this, we do weekly classes. We got the book club, we got the movie club, we got the Facebook investment group. We got bi-weekly real estate calls with MG, the mortgage guy. We got monthly financial planning calls with me. So we're really trying to build this out and to be like, like I, I keep saying Phoenix University because that's what I think about when I think about like online universities. I think like everybody's kind of heard of Phoenix University, mm -hmm. but I'm like, why can't EYL University be the flag bearer? And the way education is going now is like, education is the only thing that can save you. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, you know, you, you, you trying to, you know, you, you try to get a job and it's, it's good luck right now. Right. Yeah. And it's like, you know, self-education, as Mickey Fax said, formal education can get you a portion. Self-education can make you a fortune. fortune. You're not going to learn any of this stuff in any Ivy League school. Pick one. You're not going to learn any <laughs> of this stuff in any Ivy League school. That's just a fact. It's not my opinion. It's a fact. Um, and that has been told to us from hedge fund managers to VC capital um, firm owners, very high level intelligent people. They're like, yo, the information that you give, they're not teaching this in Stanford. Like not yeah. at this level where people can understand it for damn near free. So if you're interested, EYL University, like I said, this is an open house platform that we do once a month. Um, and we're running a special promo code, 40% off. Uh, the price goes up in 24 hours. So eight o'clock tomorrow, but it's 300, like $300, $340. Yeah, somebody just said that this class itself is worth the price. Yeah, for the, for, the whole, for the whole entire year. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, fact. What, can you, what can you do with that? That's, that's like what a, I said. No, that's a few bottles of Ciroc, like one bottle of Ciroc with, if, if, yeah, in the club. In the club, for that's sure. A fact. Yeah. That's a fact. Ain't, so, ain't, ain't no theories, ain't no gimmicks, man. We giving it to and, you and, real live from real live people. And man. there's no code, because before a lot of people was asking about the code, it was an issue. So for 24 hours, we took the code off, but it's a special link. You can only use the link in the YouTube description or the link that's pinned in YouTube. So if you're watching it, that's the only way you can get that. It's not on the website. You got to go through that link. I'll put it in the, in the chat again. But yeah, let's go to my let's favorite part. So this is the so the classes work like this, where the presenter comes on and they present PowerPoint presentation. And then afterwards, the public EYL University members gets to ask them questions. And this is the, my favorite part, because this is like mentorship in a sense, where it's like you watch a podcast and that's great. You get information, but people have questions. You try to DM these people, it, you know, it's hard for them to respond back. So this is the part that actually, to me, is even the best. People get a sense of this in Market Mondays, but that's just a sense. Like, this is what we do every week, where people ask questions and they actually get to engage with these high level educated people. So. Let's let's get to some some let's some questions. I'm gonna go to Houston native. And shout out to Julian Gordon. That's our guy. Shout what out to up? Ju what up? Julian what up, Gordon, um, EYL professor, a legend in his own right. That's a yeah. fact. That's a fact. Uh, I'm going to my boy straight out of Houston, Darius. Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted, bro. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? I'm in the hey, building. Everything hey, yeah, good, man. man. How you? What's good with you, bro? Man, I cannot complain. I cannot complain. Loving the fact that we that we uh went the gentrification and buying back the block route with this one. I was definitely happy to uh to hear and see see that post right there, man. Chris, how you doing? I'm good, brother. How are you? I can't complain, I can't complain at all. Um, I guess my question is is my question is not necessarily general, 
But as far as gentrification is concerned, mm -hmm. um, you spoke a little bit about identifying neighborhoods mm -hmm. or zip codes or uh, just specific areas that may be ready to go through gentrification. I'm in Houston. I'm, I'm, I'm downtown right now. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so like the Heights, I'm familiar with the Heights. Mm -hmm. I live near Humble. I'm familiar with Fifth Ward, Thir Third Ward, all of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm driving through this stuff all day, every day. And I'm seeing exactly what it is you've done. Yeah. I'm seeing exactly <laughs> yeah. what it is. Yeah. Like it's not, if you, like if, you it's come, not if you come from Humble, you see both of my projects from the freeway. <laughs> that, that part. So I'm like, <laughs> right, right over here on Elgin, mm -hmm. 59 and Elgin. Yeah. Where we coming from downtown over the third ward, like those properties that are right there alongside the freeway. Mm -hmm. I saw them when they was raggedy. I saw them when they knocked them down. I saw them when they pinned them up. Yep. So I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, so how do I go about identifying areas that are on the cusp or already in the process of the gentrification? Mm -hmm. And then as far as getting in on that, I like the way that you built that you built that out. So I'm, my question is, is like, you you still doing your thing in Houston. So is there an area that I can kind of just be like, okay, this is what Chris was talking about right here. Uh, Man, it's, it's, it's tons of it. Right. I mean, you name you name some of them. That Elgin area, that's that's third ward. Um, closer to TSU, you get those opportunities. You go south towards Sunnyside outside of the medical center. They call it Sunnyside, used to be the hood, they call it Medical Center South now. <laughs> um, fifth Ward still has a ton of opportunity, man. It's just getting started. Like I said, that big project won't even be complete till 2023. So you got three or four neighborhoods right there, um, all along 59 that uh that'll be prime for you to uh, try to try to get. And, and can you talk about um you spoke about it briefly, but you spoke about it on the podcast also city mm -hmm. development and urban planning websites. Yeah, so every city every city has a planning and development department. Some of them call it urban planning, and they some of, some of them call it planning and development. Um, but in that in that uh, sector of the website, there's always their plans. They have five year, 10 year, 20 year plans. Um, some of them we post in uh, the different variance requests that are coming up for different uh, developer projects. And so on that site, you can see where the city is trying to go with redevelopment. And you can see where the city is planning to reinvest in infrastructure over the next five years or 10 years. And so that can be a key indicator of where you should go as well, because especially if it's a city that's they has the ability to get grant money, that type of thing. They're going to be enticing developers and other people to go in there to be that catalyst, like the big project I showed y'all. Um, and so once you see those types of things, then, it, then it's time for you to try to, you know, just get in the money flow of what's going on in that area. So. Yeah. So, so Darius, appreciate you, bro. Houston Zone. Yo, you didn't notice, but I, I put Beyonce up there for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, shout out. <laughs> we got to shout out a few, a few, a few of our loyal supporters in Houston, Texas. Um, from the hip hop side, Toby Nguigwe. Yeah, that's our guy. He's ten. He's guy. We, we had him. We had him on the on the show, and he's ten. And he's the hottest dude out right now. Yeah, I seen him last night at the hip hop awards. He did his thing. Lil Kiki, yeah. legend. Legend came to our event. He came to our event <laughs> in Houston him at the airport. Jazz Prince reached Sad. out to me on Instagram. Shout out to J shout out to the whole oh. Prince family. We got a crazy yeah. story about the Prince family. Paul Wall. <laughs> Paul Wall. Ran into him at the airport. Yep. Yo, we we coming to Houston, man. We coming. To Houston. <laughs> Don't forget Slim. Slim Thug. Slim yeah. Thug ran into him also. Shout out to Slim Thug. Yo, we had a crazy weekend. Shout, 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 shout out to Matt Hatter. Yo, that was a crazy weekend. It was a crazy shout weekend. Out oh, Matt Hatter. Hatter. Shout yeah. out to Matt Hatter. Shout out to Matt Hatter, man. Show. So yeah, I just wanted to shout everybody in Houston. Out, shout man. out to Mike Brown, alumni. Shout alumni. out to Mike yeah, Brown, Mike, man. Mike, yeah. Shout out to Jazz too. Yeah, 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 yeah. From Lake Chateau. That's a yeah. fact, Jasmine. What up? What up? Uh, let's go to uh, I'm gonna mix your bass. Let me see. I hope I got that right. Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. What's going on? Nope. Ooh, we know there's no fridge. <laughs> oh, every time I say fridge, they jump <laughs> on. What's going on? What's going on? Um, yeah, I just want to ask real quick when you did that crowdfunding, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so was that with a promise of keeping the properties and renting them out, or are you giving out dividends? How is that? How are they getting a return on their money? That's and what platform crowd? That's a great question. Yeah. So the, the platform I use is called BuyTheBlock.com, um, based out of Denver, Colorado. But yeah, so they are getting dividends. So they what I'm doing is I'm taking forty percent of the net profit from the rents, and I'm dividing that up, and I'm sh sending that out uh, to everybody. And so just like in the dividend, um, it'll be between like two to three percent like one and a half to three percent of the investment amount but you know you're on nike stock you get a one percent dividend 
Um, and so, you know, with this, you, you also get the share value appreciation because you're not just donating money, you're not lending money. You actually bought a piece of ownership of this property. So as the property value goes up, your share value goes up. And so that's where the real return is. And so the way I have the project uh, set up, it's supposed to be a seven year project. So, um, you know, we bought it for 1.2, um, projecting it'll be worth about 3 million in about seven years. And then, so you have options to sell your shares and get out, um, or we can refinance it and stay in and basically everybody can still pull their initial capital out they initially invested. So that, that's how it got it structured. So appreciate that. Appreciate uh, Sharetta, we coming to you. I hope I said your name right. Sharetta, I hope, I... oh, she ready to? Yeah, you said it right. There we go. There we and go. you was ready right when I pressed on mute. Thank you. I, I, was, I, was, I was ready to pounce. I was ready to pounce. Let's do it. <laughs> okay, so um, I just want to say I, I've been with EYO you made about 45 days, and yo, this is so worth the investment. <laughs> I appreciate it. Appreciate that. Uh, Chris, it's finally nice to see your face, because I tell you, I'm kicking myself that I did not join when you guys had this out on bytheblock.com. Oh, <laughs> oh, there'll be more there'll be more coming yeah, more to come <laughs> man but i i love the the thought process so um one of the questions i really had was for someone like myself i um actually came across a property about three years ago in one of these up-and-coming neighborhoods um i'm getting ready to actually build my first home and one of my things is you know i'm kind of torn in the fact that you know it is you know developers are coming in that don't necessarily look like us. So what advice would you have for someone getting in the game that necessarily doesn't have the capitalization to go and buy the block um, and starting out with that one, one piece here and there? Yeah, definitely start wherever you can. Um, yeah, the developers are gonna come, like I said, you can't really stop them. Um, so, you know, we, we, some of the other concepts we'll talk about maybe like getting a small group of people together to, to co-invest with you, um, you can, maybe two or three people that may have some money sitting in an old uh, savings account or old uh, 401k we talked about earlier. You can use that as your down payment and maybe have another partner that has good credit, you know, if you're gonna try to do something. Um, I wouldn't say try to start with ground up development or new, new construction. I would suggest you try to buy some, you know, something that's in decent condition already. Mm -hmm. um, even, the, even the new build in the right area, if the, the, uh, the construction and the redevelopment is happening quickly, uh, you can still you can still get equity in your home pretty quickly, whether it's an investment or it's your primary residence. Um, and what I also tell people too is like if you want to be an investor and you want to be a landlord, um, you got to think about if you're buying something that's existing, um, even if it passes inspection, right? The inspectors are only looking for things that are wrong. But if you got a house that's let's say it's 20 years old and they put a 20 year well they put a let's say they put a 30 year roof on it. You got a plan as a as as the owner of that property that to replace a roof in five or six years or ten years max, right? That's right. type of things people don't think about. Whereas if you buy a brand new property in a community like this, where the property the values are going up, you know everything's new, so you have a longer uh, runway before you have to start investing in repairs. So just th just things to think about. And if you haven't, well, if you haven't used like your first time home buyer credit or anything like that, you can get into something with three percent down. And even if you don't want to stay in it forever, just stay in it for a little while and turn it into an investment property. Got it. Mm -hmm. All right, I appreciate it. Thanks. A lot of game there. Appreciate you. Appreciate it. First time home buyers, you say? <laughs> yep. <laughs> and, and, and and people, they watching our journey. Like you know, we did trucking because we did the trucks. But shout out to Alex. So we just brought our first truck, and um, we're gonna be like showing people the journey into that. So um, watch what we doing in um, Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah. We got shout out to Beyond Wind. Shout out to Big Business. Shout out to everybody in Cleveland, but. Oh yeah, they killed. But we might come to Houston. I'm thinking about Houston, bro. Like, Houston. I'm like, yo, bro, we got a lot of love out there. We, we I remember we was just in a random strip mall eating. They was just like, yo, we love you out here. I'm like, yo, y'all know us. We gotta talk about the prices out there. I was about to say, man, I can't. We, we can't compete with those prices up there, though, man. Yeah, Cleveland, <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio is is different right now. Yeah, we, we got an open invitation to Nashville as well. We might. There's there's a, there's a couple cities we might have to look at. Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah. Shout out to Nashville. Let's see. Uh, I haven't seen this thing before. Garth, we coming to you. Garth, unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. Hey guys, it's Garth. Um, Chris. Garth, can you turn your volume up just a little bit? Well, hold on. Is 
Yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. They was about to hit you with the guidelines, bro. <laughs> I know. I know. I know it was coming as I was rushing. Fabulous presentation, Troy, Rashad. You know, fabulous job. Keep up the good work. Appreciate um, you. Chris, um, you know, the, the, the stuff that you're doing there, I'm here thinking, I'm like, dude, we, we need to replicate this across the country. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, just clone you or you create mm -hmm. disciples and just spread them across the U.S. and we just do our thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, that's, that's what I'm, I'm seeing right now. Mm -hmm. um, I know Julian down in uh, New Orleans. He's doing his thing down there as well. Yep. I'm saying we have all these resources, man. We need to pull this together. Troy and Rashad, you guys are the, um, the, uh, the link between, you know, to pull all this together you know, create a masterclass or something where we, we get everybody together and put put something like this together where we, you know, we, rep, we this this energy and just replicate it across the country and just put in different pockets across the country and just do our thing, man. Yeah, I mean, like that's, I said, that's all I wanted to say. But, uh, she, appreciate I, you, I, I appreciate that. Shout out to Julian Gordon. He's doing something similar um, in New Orleans, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, we got Brandon Rule, who's one of the top real estate developers in, in the United States of America right now. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of we got a lot of relationships with a lot of good people. MG, the mortgage guy, who's the number one real estate financing expert online. So mm -hmm. maybe we can maybe we can form a conglomerate. Yeah, superpowers. Super pack. Yeah. EYL, EYL super pack. We're coming to take over the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. But yeah, my Garth, man, I appreciate the comment, man. That, but that's exactly what I'm doing. That's why I'm being so transparent with everything because it's way too much for me to try to tackle on my own. And I, I'm not, I'm not the, the boastful, bragful, arrogant guy. I, I just want everybody on the same wave, man. It's, it was frustrating not seeing enough of us doing this. Yeah. So, and it's, yeah. man, it's funny. I would be in conversations with all of these intellectuals, these, Ivy League graduates from our community, and they would tell me why it wouldn't work. And eventually, I was just like, "I'm just gonna do it. I'm just gonna show them that it can work." You know, and I think that's what it takes for a lot of us just to get get in there and start doing it. They keep driving down that highway. They're gonna see what you're doing. Right. <laughs> it's, it's there. Right, Wanda, we are coming to you. Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. What's up? Hi, y'all. First of all, I love you. I love the show. I love the platform. I've told everybody in my organization, I have 1,200 people about this. Well, the Black people. So, um, <laughs> we love so, everybody. Um, <laughs> so I, I have this like pipe dream of building um, a thriving Black community. And I call it a pipe dream because I, I like the strategy that you're talking about in terms of going into an area that's on the verge of revitalization or gentrification. Mm -hmm. But I have a question about an area like Gary, Indiana, mm -hmm. where, and I'm from New York. I don't know anything about Gary. It came to me in a dream. Um, so Gary, um, there was white flight and then black flight in the 50s and 60s. Um, industry left the place. And right now it's virtually abandoned over the past 40 years. Mm -hmm. But slowly but surely, like I heard that there's a hotel coming to the beach area and there's an um, investment in uh, building a new school. So my question is, what do you think about going into an area that is not even quite on the verge of revitalization um, and buying the block there and maybe uh, networking with other real estate investors who are black and trying to lure people from Chicago who are 30 minutes away. A lot of them left Gary to go to Chicago. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that as a strategy? Is it really a pipe dream? Should I move forward or should I look for a place that is already um, gentrifying or revitalizing right now? That's definitely a, a risk tolerance question, okay? Because you don't know how long it's going to take for that to take off. If you can invest in it and hold it long enough where it's not, if you got money that's not going to hurt you to invest in the property and just let it sit there and wait for that to happen, then that's, that, that's okay. But if you're expecting a quick return on whatever you're about to do, I would say go somewhere where the bet is more sure, you know, where you have where you have a more solid opportunity to get into whatever you're going to do, make some money and continue to expand. Um, I think that happens a lot of times people buy property in the wrong neighborhoods and the values don't appreciate. Sometimes the values are stagnant or they even go down and you end up losing money if you look at inflation and everything else and your cost of like taxes and insurance and all that kind of stuff. So you got to be really, really strategic with that. Um, I, I, I personally wouldn't suggest it. But if you have the capital to do it, then, you know, it's, 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 it won't hurt to try. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Wanda. I, I appreciate y'all. Appreciate you. I think that's a question a lot of people have, like, coming from New York or whatever. It's like or L.A., where it's, it's just the real estate is crazy and they want to go to these different towns. But it's like you don't know anybody. And the reason why I said Cleveland, Ohio, is that we really built a strong relationship with Beyond Win. Shout out to him. Just a real solid dude. And, um, you know, 
that's somebody that we trust. And it's like, you know, even Maurice Claret, mm-hmm. a good friend of mine um, who's out in Columbus, Ohio. So, you know, I really know like these people are actually, they live out there. They, you know, so I, I'm not going to go to anybody's turf and try to do the Christopher Columbus thing yeah. and just take no. over. And you know what? That is a great point because like those, like we're beyond them are there, there is a strong rental market there and there's not enough housing. So if, if, the, if that's the business case that you're looking at, then you still, it still makes sense because you can buy the chop the property really, really inexpensively and still have positive cash flow and make great returns. Really. I'll tell you another great place to find people that are from other places inside the our investment group. I'm telling you, like every time that somebody posts it's like, yo, hey, I live in Houston. Is there anybody that is a developer in Houston? It's a great resource. Yo, is there anybody in Cleveland? Every day I see it, like somebody from another part of the country is like, yo, anybody here in this area? It's a great way to network and a great way to resource and, and, and come together, right? If I'm not from Gary, I'm guaranteeing out of the 5,000, almost 6,000 people, Somebody knows the area. And and Matt, Matt was doing, he's gonna bring it back, but he was doing- uh, Each city, right? Each city. Yep. So he did like the real estate updates for the Bay Area, the real estate updates for Houston, the real estate updates for Philly. Philly. Yep. Those are good resources too, because it's yep. like now that's specific for that area. So even if you don't live in Philly, but you're interested in Philadelphia real estate, you can network. It's all about networking. That mm-hmm. was my whole point is that it's just about networking. And I feel like, um, you know, a lot of times what's stopping us is the relationships. And that's another thing that we built um, with the university is just relationships, but just in general and just in life, like you might have a family member, you ain't have a cousin, you might have to, you know, you, you never know who you're going to meet or, or get introduced to, but relationships can take you a long, long way. You can have all the knowledge in the world, but if you don't have the relationships, you might not be able to execute. So mm-hmm. it's relationships are extremely, extremely important in my opinion. Uh, Bianca, we coming to you. Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. What's up? Hi, how you doing? I love how fast y'all respond. Great. Everything's great. I just didn't expect that to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so my question is probably very similar to one of the first questions, but I never get to get on, so I'm just going to say it. <laughs> um, so just to, about the opportunity zones. So I'm from Augusta, Georgia, and I moved to Minneapolis five years ago, and I noticed North Minneapolis is like one of the most undeveloped, neglected places in Minneapolis. Mm-hmm. But I just read something today about the city planning to put a concert venue up there. They they're getting like b- millions of dollars. Would you consider this like a opportunity zone? Well, so an opportunity zone is actually a, a government designation for p- specific okay. neighborhoods okay. that have like a specific low income demographic um, or like and they have like usually issues like food deserts where there's no grocery stores and those types of things. Mm-hmm. And so those zones were created um to uh to kind of pinpoint areas where the government wanted these high net worth people or people that have capital gains to invest and park their money for uh, up to 10 years to in, in in exchange for getting a tax abatement basically a tax deferment and like whatever whatever they buy over the 10 years they uh they they actually can uh ex- like sell it at the end and not pay any taxes on that at all um so I'm not sure if that you'd have to you, you can really just Google Opportunity Zone map and it'll tell you if that area is an opportunity zone or not. Okay. And then um, it sounds like something that, that may be a catalyst for other development to come around it. So I would definitely I, w- I would stay tuned to see what's going on. Um, if you know any realtors, anybody that may be in that that may know that market, I would say you should just you should just talk to them to see if they know of any realtors that represent builders and new construction um, that because if those builders are looking at that area, and that tells you that things are, are about to pick up. Okay. All so, right. Thank you. Yep. You know what? I just thought about something. Thank and, you, Bianca. Uh, we're gonna do Janet. Hopefully, you can uh, help us out with this. <laughs> um, we have almost four thousand members in our in our um, private real estate, our private investment group on uh, Facebook. So we should we could um we can set up um geographical groups. Like we can have a New York group. We can have an LA group. Mm-hmm. We can have a Philly. Like you know what I mean, so mm-hmm. that way people. Yeah. Um, can they can identify themselves by like where they actually live. Mm-hmm. And like I say, even if you don't live, so even if you live in New York, but you might be interested in Houston real estate, if there's 300 people from Houston in a Houston group, now you can network with them and that gives you 300 people that you can actually, you know, reach out to and build with. So exactly. we're going to get that done. Janet, you heard that. Janet, thank you in she, advance. She about to blow up. I, I guarantee you by seven o'clock, I'm gonna have 14 text messages. Shadi said, Shadi said it. I appreciate that. 
Uh man, let's go to a new name. Oh, Whitney. I haven't seen this name before. Whitney, what's going on? Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. Hey guys, uh, thanks for this uh, this awesome information. I appreciate it. I appreciate everything that EYL is bringing to the table. And I'm a newbie. I've only been a member about uh, about a month or so, um, but I'm really happy to be here. Welcome to the fam. I uh, appreciate that, bro. Um, I got a message for Chris. Um, I uh, serve on the political side and the community side uh, for mm -hmm. a lot of uh, housing agencies or community mm -hmm. redevelopment uh, boards and economic development boards. And I do that, as I said, in the uh, actually put my question in the thing, um, just so I can be at the table and hear about deals that are coming down mm -hmm. and actually bring it back to our community. Mm -hmm. um, but I get a lot of pushback from our community because mostly I think because they just they they see that their communities are being changed and mm -hmm. and they feel helpless to get involved mm -hmm. um, or helpless to do anything about it because they don't have the financial wherewithal to do anything. Mm -hmm. What um what are some strategies that you've used or that you've seen used that actually uh, help to engage local communities, particularly our community, black people, um, and bring them along through this process? Man, you know, it's, it, it's tough. I mean, I, I, thankfully the projects that I have, they, they kind of see something different and they see that I'm not displacing people, but for the, for the, a lot of times people are, are just adverse to change. Right. Um, so I think the best thing that you could do probably would be, to bring in a group of uh, investors, if you know a group of investors or developers that may be of the right mindset, and have them come and talk to the community, and you know, if you if you know where the projects are going and you know what's coming, put the put that group in front of the projects and let them, you know, be, uh, interface with the community and kind of bring some of the the amenities and services that the community may be looking for or explain to them why it's not the right time for certain things. Like, you know, a lot of the communities, like, like I said, they'll, they will want the grocery store now and they'll want this and that now, but they don't want the new housing, you know, they don't, and you have to explain to them, well, this is why you need that. This is why you need uh, some people that look like you in the community that earn more money so that it can be attractive for Starbucks or it can be attractive for the grocery store to come back. Um, so a lot of it's just open communication. Um, but th there is no cookie cutter answer, man. You, you're never going to get everybody on board, unfortunately. But I mean, you know, you can kind of turn the tide a little bit by doing some of those things. True, true. I appreciate that, guys. Thank you very much. We really appreciate you. Oh, here we go. My guy's here. Arthur. All rise. King Arthur, you've been unmuted. <laughs> peace, peace. What's good, fellas? What's going on, What's going bro? On? Slow motion. How y'all doing? Yeah, we good, man. We good. Yeah. No doubt. Hey, uh, Chris, man, definitely a big fan. I'm, I'm actually an investor in the, uh, in the Lions Avenue project. Love it. I love it. Yeah. I, I um, when, uh, I actually right, right before, right as COVID hit, I got, I got into the uh, project and I joined EYL. That was kind of how I split the bread up for it. So. <laughs> you know, all cylinders, huh? <laughs> exactly. Definitely. Uh, looking forward. Uh, definitely a big fan. Been following the mod project as well. Congrats on that. Thank you. Um, as we talk about building the community, um, one one of the uh, things that you mentioned uh, with the with the project that you said, you know, most none of those houses were like Section Eight houses and stuff like that. Those are all pretty much working class individuals. Mm -hmm. That being said, Section Eight is like one of the largest subsidies our community gets. Like mm -hmm. literally, it's about eight billion dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And the majority of that money goes to black women, as we know, who are generally the head of households for those mm -hmm. communities. Mm -hmm. And so as you're building your plans and as you know, you speak on others and how they should expand, um, how do you view or what ways do you think that we have to actually include that so we don't walk away literally from $8 billion a year that now is going to mm -hmm other people who own that affordable housing to a certain degree because our own people are scared or don't want to deal mm -hmm. with those section eight housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, number one, let me point out the reason why I pointed that out earlier is for the opposite reason, right? Because we all, we automatically assume everybody in these neighborhoods is all um, strictly on government assistance, but there are some people that are just hardworking that, you know, are, are on fixed incomes. Now, as far as the, you know, the, the single women, especially, or anybody that's on Section 8, um, I think that with the right landlords in place, and uh, I, I think it can actually be a better system because, you know, if we are the ones controlling the real estate and own the real estate and those are our tenants, then we'll, we'll probably look out for them a little bit more than somebody else that's, you know, 
living across the country or living in, a, in another neighborhood that doesn't really care about the community. Um, but most importantly, when you talk about a way to uh, leverage home ownership that we don't really talk about, um, those those vouchers can be used for mortgage payments, just like they can be used for Absolutely. rent. So educating more of the people in our community about how to get their credit together to get uh, in, into a first time home buyers program and get a, a down payment assistance grant and then convert that same voucher over to something that can help pay the mortgage. We can create more home ownership in the community using that same tool. So so um, so in a way, for, th for those who are looking how to replicate what you're doing on a smaller scale, one of the things they can do is look to take advantage of those government programs and using mm -hmm. their own home buying, i.e. Matt's home buyers, home buyers, <laughs> of course, you know, using those types of things in their own personal lives to, to, to kind of replicate on a micro scale what you're doing at the macro level. Definitely, definitely. And that's actually a way for people that have existing rental portfolios if they want to get out of them. A lot of people are converting over to owner finance. So, um, so basically the same tenant stays in the property but now they're, they are buying the property. So now they're responsible for the insurance and the taxes and all those things. So if you have a section eight tenant and there's a house that you don't want to get, you know, you may, you may not want to keep in your portfolio, you could actually sell it to them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and create a homeowner out of one of your tenants, especially if they've been loyal, long-term tenants. You know, um, it's, it's, a, it's a million ways to, uh, to, be, to make that program benefit us more. I appreciate it, brother. Thank you. you know, Arthur, Arthur one, one last, I just want to ask you a question because you're one of our most prestigious students. <laughs> at EYL University, and you always tap into every single thing we, we got going. Um, how, how has your experience been with EYL University? It's been, it's been fabulous, man. It's been fabulous. I, I, listen, I went to a prestigious all-boys prep school in high school, Avon Old Farms. Um, I could have went to all, most of them, the Ivy Leagues. I ended up going to George Washington University. You know what I mean? That's very prestigious school. Yeah. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Um, however, in terms of the actual practical knowledge that I learned outside of me just working and doing the things that I did in my career, I would say this has definitely been one of the most comprehensive uh, uh, education platforms that I've ever been a part of. You know what I mean? You guys brought me to Chris. You guys brought me to Matt. Uh, you brought me to Beyond. You know what I mean? Um, wow. And so in terms of actually executing and getting things done, there's, 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 there's nothing better. You know what I mean? I was an econ major. I was a finance major. All of that stuff, and it, it doesn't come close to the practical knowledge. All of that stuff that they're gonna teach you in the schools, you can go Google that. But this know how this get it done, this 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 uh you know get the seller financing and transfer that into into a private investment for the IRA and then transfer okay. that talk, into talk to them. And getting it done. But you they're not gonna teach you that at Harvard and nowhere else. At Harvard, they're gonna teach you the exact opposite of what Chris is teaching. They're going to teach you how to ultimately rape your community. Chris is going to teach you how to get it done and get the bag. So I appreciate you fellas for it. I'll always participate. I'll always speak highly. And, you know, uh, appreciate you guys for always letting me rock. Appreciate King you. Arthur. Appreciate man. that, brother. Most prestigious. <laughs> Arthur, man, he's extremely, extremely intelligent guy, man. He used, oh, to, be a market, man. He used to be a market maker on Wall Street. Whew. Wow. That's our guy. Yeah, so that this means is, that, this that is means another one of our of, of our dudes, man. Pac, what's going on? Unmute yourself. Yo, what's going on? Yo, we uh, missed you Sunday, bro. Man, it's, I was struggling without without. <laughs> it's all good, man. I'm happy you're here now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm making sure I'm coming back. I was like, I ain't never missed another another episode ever. <laughs> it's like, gotcha. But um, yeah, no. Um, thanks for all the information, Chris. I just had just one, you know, short question. Throughout the whole process that you've done, what would you think is like the hardest uh, step that you had to take, like before you got to where you're at right now? Man, I would say every every step is, has its own challenges. Um, I would say the most the most difficult things I had going was when I was trying to um, figure things out on my own and not find somebody that was an expert at what I was trying to get done and and putting them in place to do something to help me out. So. I mean, that, that's really been the biggest thing, man. Um, I would say with the, the new construction project, like the roadblock with the infrastructure was pretty tough. Um, and having to negotiate with the city to figure out, you know, a, a solution for that. Um, and let me think on the on the crowdfund side, I think the, the hardest part was getting the deal done on the front and just negotiating with the sellers and making them understand, you know, why I needed them to come down on price and why I needed them to sell their finance to me. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, every, everything, every deal you do, you're going to have a different challenge. So just be prepared for that. Appreciate you, Pac. Shout out to Chicago, man. Chris, can we get like 10 more minutes of your time? Yeah, yeah, let's go. Uh, yeah, let's... Somebody on YouTube, shout out to Yes to Real Estate. They 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 uh, sent a couple Andre. of messages. You, you read that message? No, I know Andre though. Yes to Real okay, Estate. Okay, okay. Yeah, 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 he said it's Andre, uh, Yes to Real Estate. We're, we're breaking ground on our four townhouse in Fifth Ward yep. in two months. We're three blocks from you, so. Yep, yep. Y'all, y'all, taking, over the whole, y'all taking over the whole neighborhood. I love it, definitely, I love it. Definitely, definitely. Melissa, what's going on? You've been unmuted. Hi, how are you guys? Everything's good. Good, how are you? Thank you so much for having this open forum. It's been very informative. I got on a little late, but I will rewatch. I did want to ask Christopher a question about um, buying back Harlem. And what do you mm-hmm. suggest? I'm born and raised here. I've been approached with a lot of negativity in, ch- in terms of trying to open up a business. However, a lot of businesses have closed due to COVID. And I just kind of wanted to know a way on how to approach that. Wow, that's a very, there, there's a lot of variables in that equation, right? Because um, number one, the type of business you, you're going to want to start. Um, and then when you see a bunch of businesses closing, don't think it's for no reason. You know, they, they're closing because they, they, they tried to stay open and they couldn't. Now, I mean, of course, that is going to open a new wave of opportunity on the backside. Um, but I, I'm not really familiar with the, Har- the Harlem market or like the price points there. So I wouldn't want to give you any bad advice. It's, it's not mm-hmm. clear cutter uh, blanket across the board. Um, so I would say I'll, um, maybe do what I would do in any situation is find local experts that uh, are doing what you're trying to do. Um, okay. Maybe talk to a commercial broker that uh, has clients that have bought businesses or or rented spaces to start businesses and have closed those businesses and find out what challenges their clients had and then figure out, you know, your next move. So uh, yeah, don't, don't go into it blindly. Don't, don't go into it uh, trying to figure it out on your own for sure. I'm going to be honest. And it's like, you know, we live in New York. We've been in New York our entire lives. Our whole family has been in New York their entire lives pretty much. And, you know, I was always really pro New York. I still am, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm pro New York. Nah, I'm, you know, but the more I travel, I've been traveling a lot lately and, um, don't do it. 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 I ain't gonna let you do it. Don't do it. No, nah, the one thing that Donald Trump said is like, I don't know if the city's ever really gonna fully recover. Okay. And it's so much regulation, it's so much red tape, it's so much hassle. The prices are through the roof in every neighborhood. It's just really, you know, for me, I'm like, you go to places like Atlanta, you just travel around and it's um I don't know, man. New York City is uh Vastly becoming, time. It's vastly becoming overrated. It hurts my heart to say that. It really hurts my heart to say that, but it's, it's, it's I think it's, I think it's true. I, I'm, I appreciate that you said that. It's, 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 it's challenging times for our city, man, but hopefully we'll recover. Hopefully. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. I'm just, I'm just optimistic. I'm going to be optimistic about it. Uh, Head to Atlanta. <laughs> uh, Jerome. Jerome, unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. What's going on? Yo, what up? What up? What up, man? What's going on? Um, I guess my question is branched off of some of the things that have been answered already. But um, Chris, you talked about earlier in your slides. Um, well, first of all, you know, buying back the block. You always, when you come from, you know, lower income black neighborhoods, that's always the dream. You and your homeboys like, yo, you know what I mean? I'm going to buy back the block. I'm going to buy this. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess in my case, I got I got some of my homeboys. We all kind of got a financial background of some sorts, um, but we new to this. And I know you said that don't all come in as rookies, as novice. Um, so I guess my question is, where would you start to find someone who understands these contracts? Where you like, yo, you know, what I mean, I'm a I'm gonna put down this amount, but you can become a partner, or you know, like I'm a seller finance. Or how how do I find? Outside of just networking, because I know um, Troy and Rashad was like, they found somebody in Cleveland that they can trust. Mm -hmm. So one is trust. And two, do you you go look, I mean, do you look for a professional? I guess this is a a big question, but do you look for a professional? How do you find somebody to join your group that not only you trust, but has that knowledge of not just book knowledge, but knowledge to say, all right, when this happens, this, you know, this, this. Like I, that's, I guess that's my question. If that makes any sense. So where, where, where are you located? 
Um, so I'm located in Virginia. Right now I live in Northern Virginia, but I'm from Southern Virginia, Hampton, uh, like in the Hampton University area, if, you know, if you're familiar with that, Norfolk State, uh, some HBCUs in the area. Um, but it's a lot of areas, black areas, Newport News, Norfolk, Portsmouth, um, that are on the verge of, I would say, gentrification, but they're not quite there yet. And we're trying to get active in the market. But, you know, we don't have that, 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 that game, that real game, not just open up a book game. But like you said, you, you know all the ins and outs. And, and we're just trying to look for something like that. Man, so I would say, once again, just uh, try to find local mentors. Um, and not, nece- not, nece- not necessarily somebody to invest with you, but maybe you have to just pay somebody for the knowledge, for the time, um, you know, just to get into it. But, you know, um, I got a platform called learnfromchris.com. You can go in there and it'll give you a lot of the basic information. And then that'll, that'll put you in a position if you want to go talk to somebody locally. Because sometimes uh, active investors don't want to deal with people that they can tell are completely green, you know. Um, so if you can go in there and get yourself acclimated to some things, go to YouTube. Um, there's a lot of stuff on there. Um, and I, I, I'm not trying to be cliche, but I'm just saying like, try to get yourself as educated as possible so that when you get in front of these people, you can have a, an intelligent conversation with them about what you're trying to do. Um, and man, Virginia has a lot, a lot of investors. I mean, you could between Instagram, I know, I know several between Instagram and Facebook that, uh, might be able to help you. You can also look up local meetups, you know, just type in whatever nearest big city to you and investment meetups. And that'll bring you to some, some groups that may have somebody that's willing to work with you, but man, networking on between social media, uh, platforms like earn your leisure and, um, and uh, yeah, just the, the, the Facebook groups, um, man, I, I'm pretty sure you can find somebody if you, if you, if you all are looking. Being like there. I said, we going we going we going through that on our Facebook group. I think that's yeah, a good yeah. idea. Yeah, Chris, I'm I'm gonna take a quote, and Jerome, you can you can use this quote and apply it, man. I took this right from your page. I was like, this is dope. Yeah. You said there's three things you need to be successful: the knowledge, the opportunity, and the money. One you can control, the two you gotta go find. That's it. <laughs> so take that with you, Jerome. Knowledge, opportunity, and money. One you control, two you gotta go find, my man. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Appreciate you. Sure. When you see me running through Atlanta. <laughs> In LA, Los Angeles, A-L-B. Houston, Texas, and these things. LA too. It's a gray cloud over New York right now. Hey, yo, B- <laughs> I seen B Rule put your Atlanta headquarters oh, on the way. E- EY Atlanta headquarters is That's, already it's yeah, already we, up and running, yeah, but we already said that. We're, we're revamping it. We we yeah, we, we got B Rule, we gotta meet up somewhere, man. I, I know you in DC, but when we in Atlanta, you gotta come come check us out. Shout bro. out to DC, man. Shout out to PG County. Shout out. the earth is big though. That's why I know shout out to New York. We, it's New York forever, but I, I just say that halfway joking, only halfway. But um the earth is big though. We we can't just be stuck in our neighborhoods. It's like if something no. is too out of expensive or something is just, you know, never be afraid to to expand. Like, you know, this is this is this is the large earth that we live in even out of the country. Like, you know what I mean? Like there's no, there's no limits to anything that we do in, in life. And we put, we put geographic limits on ourselves because where we're from and the neighborhoods that we grew up in and our family, but you never know. You might be pleasantly surprised when you yeah. start to travel and you, you, you see different areas and there's different opportunities and it's different cultures and different people and they have different dialects. So, um, you yeah. know, me, I love to travel. Troy, yeah. Troy gonna be here forever, but. Yeah, I love New York, but a, a wise <laughs> man told me this, man. He said this to us the other day. He said, go where you're celebrated. That's a fact too. Go where you celebrate it, man. I was like, ooh. ooh. Well, we always gonna be celebrated in New York, Brooklyn. Shout out to BK. Shout out to BK. Go where market. you celebrate. I was like, that's powerful. Natalie, what's up? Unmute yourself. You've been unmuted. They've been on point. Ernest has been on point today. Oh, Natalie, like, right when I say that. All right, you know how this works. Ain't no fridge breaks. So, <laughs> Natalie, we gotta move on. We gotta move on. Uh, let's go to Samantha. Samantha, we unmuting you. Unmute yourself. Hello. There we go. Let's keep this thing rolling, Samantha. Thank you. I got picked. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <It was you. laughs> um, so good evening, everyone. Good evening. Shout out to the earners and my cousins that are listening. I sent this to them. Um, we have started our own investment group. Um, our overall goal or one of our overall goals would be to do this in Jamaica because our family's from there. Our parents are from St. Anne. And, but you know, we have to start small. Yeah, 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 I'm with that. Shout out to Jamaica. Um, So um, my question is, how did you structure uh, the business? Did you do it on your own and then do like a joint venture with other people or did you all create your own business? How did that work? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So each project I do has its own individual entity. So its own individual LLC and that LLC owns the project. And so there's several ways you can structure it from there. Um, it depends on who is playing what role. So if you're bringing on other investors, some of them may want to be a member of your LLC. Some of them want to joint venture where your two LLCs work together. Uh, some of you, some of them may want, if they just want to be passive investors, you may have to structure something where they are um, in a limited partnership with you, where you are the general partner that makes decisions and they are like a passive limited partner that may get the first returns out of the deal. Um, so it varies greatly. It really depends on the scope of the project you're trying to do. Um, I mean, there's nothing wrong with all y'all just putting together and doing one LLC if that's what you want for the first project. Um, uh, of course, this is this is not legal advice. You always should uh, seek legal counsel. But yeah, so like I said, each project I do is different, structure a little different. Right, no, that was that was that was a great question, Samantha. Appreciate you. Let's go to one more. Let's go to one more. So, and uh, I see that uh, Shannon is telling you to contact her. So hit Shannon up. She, she's in the, in the chat. Hit Shannon up. Shout out to Shannon. Let's get one more. One more. Uh, let's question. see. Let's see. This is a we haven't seen this name before. We haven't seen this name before. Ashley, we coming to you. Ashley, what's going on? Unmute yourself. Uh, You've been unmuted. What? Okay, sorry. I I'm so excited because I'm <laughs> dad... supposed to hear that part. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I appreciate y'all for, for uh, l allowing me to speak and ask questions. Chris, I want to thank you for what you're doing for the city of Houston. Um, I'm originally from Houston. My dad was born and raised in Fifth Ward. Wow. Uh, it helped mm. a, really great, a really special place in my heart. My major was urban planning. I went to Brown University. I'm a little nervous. I'm sorry. <laughs> went to Brown University, studied urban planning, came back home and was like, man, I see this happening. Like I could tell all the things that you've been talking about. Um, when you see stuff like um, infrastructure coming into place, like mm -hmm. you said, sidewalks, mm -hmm. uh, even down to um, bus buses mm -hmm. or light rails coming yep. into a community that were never there before. That's yep. another marker. And I just started seeing this like, man, when are we gonna all get on the same page and to see you do it? I moved away from Houston. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I didn't have the opportunity to invest. I mean, I will now <laughs> and I have the tools and I've been learning these last few years, but I left Houston because a lot of people weren't willing to give me the opportunity to work in urban planning and real, real estate development because I didn't have the experience. I just had the knowledge mm -hmm. and I came to LA and I, come back to Houston and I just see it like every month I've been coming back for the last three months and like yeah. it's happening like it I've been telling people and you know Paul Revere and it like hey <laughs> gentrification is coming <laughs> like you know these people are moving in here with you know their privilege but they don't have you know the roots here they're there for mm -hmm. the capitalist opportunities mm -hmm. and my one reason why I raised my hand had no idea they were going to call on me but I wanted to thank you um, personally, um, even if it's via Zoom, I, I appreciate what you're doing and sparking um, the, 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 even the thought because unfortunately, a uh, reason why I moved from Houston too is a lot of people were so driven on being corporate, corporate, corporate only. Mm -hmm. And we see something like COVID happening where the rug is pulled out from everybody. And mm -hmm. you know, uh, either you had that mindset of pivoting or now you're fumbling to, to get there. And the platform like EYL is helping, you know, people all over the globe to, to really learn how to pivot. Um, and I appreciate you guys. I'm, I'm a earn. I've been an earner since March Ooh. and I've been telling people like, Hey, you, you need to get with, I mean, I appreciate y'all putting it on YouTube, but getting in the community is totally different. Like you mentioned, when you talk to a stranger and they're believing in you and, and giving you resources, you have to be able to tap into that. It's so I don't mind paying what was due. I, I mean, luckily I did it early. So, you know, you always reward the people that adopt early and I appreciate you guys, but you know, it's still valuable at the price that it is now. Mm -hmm. Chris, I, I, I will ask, um, as it, I'll get to my question. I'm sorry. For, <laughs> I'm trying they, to, I'm they, trying to get it all out. I'm sorry. They're like, go Ashley, go. You got <laughs> <it>. <laughs> Thank y'all. Um, but, 
being in another city, do you think it's feasible? Um, I, I, because I have some of the knowledge I have, I see it and this is happening in every city in the country, you guys. So wherever you are, you, you can tap in. Um, but do you feel it's possible to be an investor from long distance or do you feel like you need to be um, in that specific city? I, I mean, LA is, prices are going down because so many people moved. So the demand is not there, but um, you know, say for instance, like a, Arizona or Nevada, I don't live there but I can tell that those city, the cities there are gonna gonna be moving into a, a, a redevelopment phase soon. So, what is your advice on that? You can definitely invest anywhere in the country. I mean, um, it's all about having a team in place, right? It's no different than investing in a stock, but you don't know where the headquarters is, you don't know where the CEO is, or you don't know where the factory is. I mean, you just have to have the right systems and the right team around you. So. Whatever city you're going to, you're going to need a good realtor, a good property manager, a good uh, contractor, and uh, somebody that can manage them, you know, um, and or you have to have good open communication with them or, you know, local investors that you partner with. That's probably the easiest way to get into a new market um, instead of trying to do it on your own. Um, so, yeah, it's definitely possible. I know I know some friends that only invest out of town. They don't even invest in the city they live in. So it's definitely uh, practical. You appreciate you. It. Appreciate there you, you Ashley. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Chris, they said that you look tired, man. <laughs> I look tired. <laughs> Hustlers don't sleep, man. Hustlers don't sleep. Yeah, I'm telling you, they be on. They say, Troy, you suspended all guidelines for tonight. Oh, man. <laughs> Come on, man. Nah. I, I got to get used to Wednesdays. <laughs> <laughs> nah, Chris, man, I really, 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 really appreciate it. We're going to go into some more stuff with, with Chris. But before before we wrap, I want to give Chris the last word. But before we finish, um, once again, for anybody that just joined at this point in time, this was just a, um, you know, open house of what we do once a month for EYL University. If you're interested in joining EYL University, we have a Facebook group. We have a book club, movie club. We do bi-weekly real estate calls with MG the Mortgage Guy. We do, we do these type of classes every single week, every Wednesday. And there's archives, like over 75 archive classes. So as soon as you join, you have access to all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And everything from disability insurance to how to buy a car to host um real estate wholesaling everything yeah. um new orientation for new earners we got what, accountability what, triads what date is the orientation i think it's going to be november 14th if i'm not mistaken i could be yep november 14th yeah, november at one 14th at one o'clock we have orientation. november 20, she just said the 21st the, 21st november 21st we have orientation we're treating this like a it's, it's a real university so yeah. like you know when you go to school and um you have freshman orientation mm -hmm. so you know, we have a lot of different spots. We got our, we got our um, Facebook group. We got the website. So it might be kind of hard for people to navigate. So we got orientation on the 21st. And um, yeah, man, this is this is definitely going to be the biggest, the biggest educational platform in, in existence. And um, 24 hours and 24 hours, the price goes up. So if you're interested in joining, the link is in only the link. The only discount link is um, in YouTube because uh, we didn't want to do a code because there's issues with the code. So just hit the hit the link in YouTube. It's pinned. I'll put it in the comment section again. And um, yeah, man, if you're interested in joining, yeah. it's only up from here. It's only up from here. But Chris, I want to give you the final word because I mean, we're gonna be doing some more stuff together. I don't know if you're ready to talk about that or not yet. But um, yeah, man, we can talk about it. You want to let him in? You want to tell him? Yeah, you know, <laughs> yeah, EYL EYL Podcast Network. Mm -hmm. You obviously know that you know the people know we have a strong track record with. Our, our our show, our podcast, and um, Market Monday. We said earlier, like in March, like we want to we want to work with other creatives and other entrepreneurs and different people to kind of you know help them out as far as their journey in in podcasting. And Market Mondays was our first experiment, and um, that was wildly successful experiment. Mm -hmm. So now we 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 got a a long list of other um, people that we're gonna bring on the label. <laughs> and um, Chris, Chris hit me up, man. So um, I think, yeah, we're going we're gonna to work on that podcast, man. Yeah, we, 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 it, it's long overdue for me, man. I just didn't have the capacity to do it on my own. So to, it's an honor to partner with the number one online <laughs> learning platform in the world. Welcome to the label. <laughs> and and, and, and this, just, this, this just goes to show, like, you know, we're working together. You mm -hmm. know, we're young, black entrepreneurs. Chris is in real estate. We're in the media space. And he recognized that we can we can bring some value to him. He can bring some value to us. So instead of us working apart, we much stronger if, if we come together. And if um 
you know, all of these big corporations can have podcast networks. Mm-hmm. Why can't, why can't EYL have a podcast network mm-hmm. and all of the relationships that we built and, and build it out from there. So yeah, you heard it first. Yeah. You heard it first, yeah. ladies and gentlemen. This is breaking news alert. <laughs> look, look, we got some. We we got a couple more breaking news alerts that we going. We ain't ready to announce them yet, but trust me, the label growing. Oh no, nah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, oh, it's, it's gonna be like gosh. Rockefeller. It's gonna be like yeah. Rockefeller in, in the early two thousands. The label growing. Yeah, at that's ex, expeditious. That's a fact. That's a fact. <laughs> but how can they? How can they? Um, your your crowd I know you said it. Your crowdfund is is full, but talk about that as far as like, are you going to open up a new crowdfund? What's your plans as far as your development? Like, let the people know how they can follow you. All the information that you you know you you, you have to give to the people. Yeah, man. So right now, I'm I'm actively looking at a few different projects that I may use for the next crowdfund. I have not figured it out yet, but as soon as I do, everybody will know, and EYL will probably be the first ones to know about it. <laughs> um, yeah, so just stay tuned for that. Um, I can technically you're gonna do one a year if you if you hit the max. So uh, actually, in the end of November, I'll be able to start putting another one together. Um, yeah, so if you want to follow me, just uh, underscore investor on Instagram. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. Um, like I said, uh, if you want to learn more about real estate investing specifically, um, you can go to learnfromchris.com. I have actually I have a free guide on five strategies where you can invest passively. So for the busy people. That don't have time and don't want to be active wholesalers or flippers. I got five strategies that I can that I'm showing you how you can truly invest passively and still make money. Um, yeah, so and uh, like that that also leads into a membership group where I, I'm probably one of the only um, instructors online that has courses that's actually talking about gentrification, talking about crowdfunding, and all those things inside the platform as well. So yeah, man, learnfromchris.com, investor on Instagram. That's pretty much it. There you have it. But investor is, is underscore, underscore I N V S T R. Yeah, yeah. The only vowel is the I. Or <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you just go to the Earn Your Leisure page and click click my. Uh, my yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we 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 put his Instagram in the um description of this video as well. That's so. a fact. Yeah. You definitely should follow Chris on Instagram. A lot, a lot of gems. Yeah, All legend. Time. That's why I said we don't throw around the word legend a lot, but this guy definitely is one, man. So shout out to Houston. Shout out to the it. third world, third ward, fifth ward. Shout out to Beyonce. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, Ivy Park joint drop tomorrow too. So be on the look. Oh, Friday. Look, be on the lookout. Go support yeah, that. Yeah, shout out to shout out to Dallas, Texas too. Yeah, I yeah, was out yeah. there for the first time. My first time in Dallas, and um, that's a dope city too. Now we just gotta go to um Austin. Yeah. We gotta go to Austin, Ooh. Texas. But um, yeah. shout out to the whole state of Texas. Don't mess with Texas, man. Everything is is what is it? Everything big, big in Texas. Texas. Everything's big in Texas. There you go. Yeah, you know <laughs> they have they having a tough time right now with the sports teams, but <laughs> it's all good. All right, it's all good, man. But nah, Chris, brother, I appreciate Always you, love. man. I appreciate you. And likewise. Uh, yeah. So stay safe, man. We'll we'll be in contact. And um, everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, this video will be saved on YouTube, so you can go back and watch it if you if you missed a part of it, um, and tell everybody about Chris and and tell everybody about all of the great work that he's doing. And hopefully, you got some information that you can actually use and replicate in your part of the world. That's what this is all about. Each one, teach one. So, all yeah, right, that's what's, what's, yeah, you have. I thought it. you were gonna say we'll see you next week. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all, month. yo, go call all somebody, right, man. man. Go call somebody. Reach out. Uh, one test can change a lifetime or change somebody's life. One call can change somebody's life. Make sure y'all do that. Go through your contact list now. Just reach out. Let somebody know you're thinking about them. That's All right. Yeah. Peace. We love y'all. We out. Peace. Chris, love, bro. All right. I got 24 hours. He ain't playing. We ain't playing. <laughs> don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't play yourself.